Ulysses by James Joyce, section 9. B. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Hugh McGuire. Michael Hind. Amanda Vlad. Colin Robertson. Wilson Lincoln. Christine Myers. Andrew Skinner. Mike Trevino. Jean-François Rondeau. Buck Mulligan rapped John Eglinton desk sharply. Whom do you suspect? He challenged. Say that he is spurned lover in the sonnets. Once spurned, twice spurned. But the Count Wanton spurned him for a lord, his drear me love. Love that dare not speak its name. As an Englishman, you mean, John, sturdy Eglinton put in. He loved a lord. Old was... Old wall where sudden lizards flash. At Sherrington, I watched him. It seems so, Stephen said, when he wants to do for him and for all other and singular unheard wombs the holy office an ostler does for the stallion. Maybe, like Socrates, he had a midwife to mother as he had a shrew to wife. But she, the jiglot wanton, did break a bed vow. Two deeds are rank in a ghost mind, a broken vow in the dull-brained yokel on whom her favor has declined. Deceased husband's brother, sweet Anne, I take it, was hot in the blood, once a wooer, twice a wooer. Stephen turned boldly in his chair. The burden of proof is with you, not with me, he said, frowning. If you deny that in the fifth scene of Hamlet, he has branded her with infamy, tell me why there is no mention of her during the third four, 34 years between the day she married him and the day she buried him. All those women saw their men down and under. Mary, her good man John, and her poor dear Willem, when he went and died on her, raging that he was the first to go. Joan, her four brothers, Judith, her husband, and all her sons. Susan, her husband too, while Susan's daughter, Elizabeth, to use granddaddy's words, wed her second, having killed her first. Oh, yes, mention there is. In the years when he was living richly in royal London to pay a debt, she had to borrow forty shillings from her father's shepherd. Explain you then. Explain the swan song too, wherein he has commanded her to posterity. He faced their silence. To whom thus, Eglinton, you mean the will that has been explained, I believe, by jurist. She was entitled to her widow's dower. A common law, his legal knowledge was great, our judges tell us. Him Satan fleers, mocker. And therefore he left out her name from the first draft, but he did not leave out the presence of his granddaughter for his daughters, for his sister, for his old cronies in Stratford and in London. And therefore, when he was urged, as I believe, to name her, he has left her his second best bed. Left there is second best, best stab, second best. Left. Whoa. Whoa! Pretty country folk had few chattels then, John Eglinton observed, as they have still, if our peasant plays are true to type. He was a rich country gentleman, Stephen said, with a coat of arms and a landed estate in Stratford and a house in Ireland Yard, a capitalist shareholder, a bill promoter, a tithe farmer. Why did he not leave her best? Why did he not leave her his best bed if he wished her to snore away the rest of her nights in peace? It is clear that there are two beds, a best and a second best. 
Mr. Second Best Best said finally. Sopracio amensa et the thalamo bettered Buck Mulligan and was smiled on. Antiquity mentions famous beds. Second Eglinton puckered, bed smiling. Let me think. Antiquity mentions that stagger right school urchin and bald heathen sage, Stephen said, who was dying in exile frees and endows slaves, pays tribute to his elders, wills to be laid in earth near the bones of his dead wife, and bids his friends be kind to an old mistress. Don't forget Nell Gwyn, Herpilis, and let her live in his villa. Do you mean he died so? Mr. Bess asked with slight concern. I mean... He died dead drunk, Buck Mulligan capped. A quart of ale is a dish of a king. Oh, I must tell you what Dowden said. What? asked Best Glinton. Williams Shakespeare and Company Limited, the people's William for terms apply, E. Dowden, Highfield House. Lovely, Buck Mulligan sapired amorously. I asked him what he thought of the charge of pedestry brought against the bard. He lifted his hands and said, All we can say is that life ran very high in those days. Lovely. Catamite. The sense of beauty leads us astray, says beautiful, beautiful sadness best to ugling Englinton. Steadfast John replied severe, The doctor can tell us what those words mean. You cannot eat your cake and have it. Sayest thou so? Will thy rest from us? From me, the palm of beauty? And the sense of property, Stephen said. He drew Shylock out of his own long pocket, the son of a malt jobber and money lender. He was himself a corn jobber and money lender with ten tods of corn hoarded in the famine riots. His borrowers had no doubt those divers of warships mentioned by Chettle Falstaff who reported his uprightness of dealing. He sued a fellow player for the price of a few bags of malt and extracted his pound of flesh in interest for every money lent. How else could Aubrey's ostler and callboy get rich quick? All events brought grist to his mill. Shylock chimes with jubating that followed the hanging and quartering of Queen's leech Lopez, his Jew's heart being plucked forth while the sheeny was yet alive, Hamlet and Macbeth, the coming to the throne of the Scotch philosopher, with a turn for which coasting the lost Amada is his jeer in love's labor lost, his pageants, his, the histories, sail full-bellied on a tide of mafficking enthusiasm, Warwickshire Jesuits are tied and we have a porter's theory of equivocation, the sea venture come home from Bermudas and play Wren and admired as Written with pasty Caliban, our American cousin, the sugared sonnets follow Sidney's. As for Fay Elizabeth, otherwise Cariety Bess, the gloss, gross virgin who inspired the merry wives of Windsor, let some merry hair from Almany grope his life long for deep hid meanings in the depth of the bucket basket. I think you're getting on very nicely. Just mix up a mixture of theological, philological. Philological. Mingo, Minxi, Mictum, Minger. Prove that he was a Jew, John Anglican dared expectantly. Your dean of studies holds he was a holy Roman. Suflamidus sum. He was made in Germany, Stefan replied, as the champion French polisher of Italian scandals. A myriad-minded man, Mr. Best reminded. Coleridge called him myriad-minded. Amplius... In societe humana hoc est maximum necessarium ut sit amiticum inter multos. St. Thomas, Stephen began. Ora pro nobis, Monk Mulligan groaned, sinking to a chair. There he keened a wailing rune. Pogmahon! Actula macri et destroyed. We are from this day. It's destroyed. We are from this All smile. Their smiles. St. Thomas, Stephen, smiling, said, whose gore-bellied works I enjoy reading in the original, 
writing of incest from a standpoint different from that of the new Viennese school Mr. McGee spoke of, likens, likens it in his wise and curious way to an avarice of the emotions. He means that the love so given to one near in blood is covetously withheld from some stranger who it may be hungers for it. Jews, from Christians taxed with avarice, are of, are of all races the most given to intermarriage. Accusations are made in anger. The Christian laws which built up the hordes of the Jews for whom, as for the Lollards, storm with shelter, bound their affections to with hoops of steel. Whether the, these be sins or virtues, old nobadaddy will tell us at doomsday leet. But a man who holds so tightly to what he calls his rights over what he calls his debts will hold tightly also to what he calls his rights over her whom he calls his wife. No, sir, smile neighbor shall covet his ox or his wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his jackass. Or his Jenny ass, Buck Mulligan antiphoned. Gentle Will is being roughly handled, gentle Mr. Best said gently. Which will, gag sweetly Buck Mulligan, we are getting mixed. The will to live, John Eglinton philosophized, for poor Anne, Will's widow, is the will to die. Requesiat, Stephen prayed. What of all the will to do? It has vanished long ago. She lies laid out in stark stiffness in that second best bed. The mobbled queen, even though you prove that a bed in those days was as rare as a motor car is now and that its carvings were the wonder of seven parishes. In old age, she takes up with gospelers. One stayed at New Place and drank a quart of sack the town paid for, but in which bed he slept it skills not to be asked. And heard she had a soul. She read or had read to her chapbooks, referring, preferring them to merry wives and losing her nightly waters on the Jordan. She thought over hooks and eyes of her believer's breeches and the most spiritual snuff-box to make the most devout soul's sneeze. Venus had twisted her lips in prayer. Agonbite of inwit, remorse of conscience. It is an age of exhausted whoredom, groping for its god. History shows that to be true. <clears throat> Inquit. Eglintomnus chronologus. The ages succeed one another. But we have it on high authority that a man's worst enemies shall be those of his own house and family. I feel that Russell is right. What do we care for his wife and father? I would say that only family poets have family lives. Falstaff was not a family man. I feel that the fat king is a supreme creation. Lean, he lay back. Shy, deny thy kindred, the uncle gid. Shy, supping with the goddess, he sneaks the cup. A sire in... Oltonian Antrim baited him, baited him, visits him here on quarter days. Mr. McGee, sir, there's a gentleman here to see you. Me? Says he's your father, sir. Give me my words worth. Enter McGee, more Matthew, a rugged, rough, rug-headed kern in strossers with a buttoned codpiece, his nether stocks bemired with a clobber of ten forests, a wand of wielding in his hand. Your own? He knows your old fellow, the widower. Hurrying to her squalid death lair from gay Paris on a quayside, I touched his hand. The voice, new warmth, speaking. Dr. Bob Kenny is attending her. The eyes that wish me well, but do not know me. A father, father Stephen said. said. Battling against, against hopelessness, hopelessness is a necessary, necessary evil. evil. He wrote the play in the months that followed his father's death. If you hold that he, a graying man with two marriageable daughters with 35 years of life, nel mezzo del camin di nostra vita, with 50 of experience is the beardless undergraduate from Wittenberg, then you must hold that a seven-year-old seven -year -old mother is a lustful queen. No. The corpse of John Shakespeare does not walk the night. From hour to hour, it rots and rots. He rests, disarmed of fatherhood, having devised a mystical estate upon his son. Boccaccio Calendrino was the first and last man who felt himself with child. 
Fatherhood, in the sense of conscious begetting, is unknown to man. It is a mystical estate, an apostolic succession, from only begetter to only begotten. On that Man, mystery, and not, and not on the Madonna, Madonna, which the cunning Italian intellect flung the mob of Europe, the Church is founded and founded ir irremovably, because founded, like the world, macro and microcosm, upon the void, upon incertitude, upon unlikelihood, amor matris, subjective and objective genitive, may be the only true thing in life. Paternity may be a legal fiction. Who is the father of any son, that any son should love him, or he any son? What, what the, the hell, hell are you driving, driving at? at? I know, shut up, blast you, I have reasons. Amplius adduc eternum postea. Are you condemned to this? There are sudden by a bodily shame so steadfast that the criminal annals of the world, stained with all other incest and bestialities, hardly record his breach. Sons with mothers, sires with daughters, Lesbic sisters, loves, loves that they dare not speak their name. Nephews with grandmothers, jailbirds with keyholes, queens with prize bulls. The son unborn, Mars beauty born, he brings pain, divides affection, increases care, he is male. His growth is his father's decline, his youth, his father's envy, his friends, his father's enemy. And Rue, Monsieur le Prince, I thought it. What links them in nature, an instant of blind rut? Am I father, if I were? Shrunken, uncertain hand. Sibelius, the African, subtlest hierarchy of all the beasts of the field, held that the father was himself his own son. The bulldog of Equin, with whom no word shall be impossible, refutes him. Well, if the father who is not a son be not a father, can the son who is not a father be a son? <laughs> when Rutland Bacon, Southam Shakespeare, or another poet of the same name in the comely of errors wrote Hamlet, he was not the father of his own son, merely but, being no more a son, he was and felt himself the father of all his race, the father of his own grandfather, the father of his unborn grandson, who by the same token never was born for nature, as Mr. McGee understands her, abhors perfection. Eglinton eyes, quick with pleasure, looked up shy brightly, gladly glancing a merry Puritan through the twisted Eglantine. Flatter. Rarely, but flatter. Himself his own father, son Mulligan told himself. Wait, I am big with child. I have an unborn child in my brain. Pallas Athena, a play. The play's the thing. Let me parturiate. He clasped at his paunch brow with both birth-aiding hands. As for his family, Stephen said, his mother's name lives in the forest of Arden. Her death brought from him the scene with Volumnia in Corianus. His boy son's death is the destine of young Arthur in King John. Hamlet the Black Prince. Is Hamnet Shakespeare. Who the girls in The Tempest, in The Pericles, in Winter's Tale are we know. Who Cleopatra, flesh pot of Egypt, and Cressid and Venus are we may guess. But there is another member of his family who is recorded. The plot thickens, John Eglinton said. The Quaker librarian, quaking, tiptoed in, quake, his mask, quake, with haste, quake, quack. Door closed. Cell. Day. They list. Three. They. I. Uh, you. He. They. Come. Mess. He had three brothers, Gilbert, Edmund, Richard. Gilbert, in his old age, told some cavaliers he got a pass for nout, for Maester Gatherer. One time mass he did, and he seen his bird, Maester Wool the Playwriter, up in London in a wrestling play with a man on back. The playhouse sausage filled Gilbert's soul. He's nowhere, but an Edmund and a Richard are recorded in the works of Sweet William. Names. What's in a name? Best. That is my name, Richard. Don't you know? 
I hope you're going to say a good word for Richard. Don't you know? For my sake. <laughs> Buck Mulligan. Piano. Dimiwendo. Then outspoke medical Dick to his comrade medical Davy. Stephen. In this trinity of black wills, the villain shake bags, Iago, Richard Crookback, Edmund King Lear, to bear the wicked uncle's names. Nay, that last play was written or being written while his brother Edmund lay dying in S Southwark. Best. I hope Edmund is going to catch it. I don't want Richard. My name. <laughs> Quaker lies here. A temple. But he that filches from me my good name. Stephen. Srigendo. He has hidden his own name, a fair name, William, in the plays, a super here, a clown there, as a painter of old Italy set his face in a dark corner of his canvas. He has revealed it in the sonnets where there is will in overplus. Like John O'Gaunt, his name's dear to him, as dear as the coat of arms he toadied for. On a bend sable a spear or steeled argent. Honor ficca billeted in habitus. Dearer than his glory of greatest shake scene in the country. What's in a name? That is what we ask ourselves in childhood when we write the name that we are told is ours. A star, a day star, a fire drake rose at its birth. It shone by day in the heavens alone, brighter than Venus in the night, and by night it shone over Delta and Cassiopeia, the recumbent constellation which is the signature of his initial among the stars. His eyes watched it, low-lying on the horizon, eastward of the bear, as he walked by the slumberous sumbers fields at midnight, returning from Chaudhary and from her arms. Both satisfied, I, too. Don't tell them he was nine years old when it was quenched. And from her arms? Wait to be wooed and won. I, Meacock, who will woo you? Read the skies. Otto Mitter Munoz Bos Stephanos Where's your configuration, Stephen Stephen? Cut the bread even S D Sua Donna Gia di Lui Gelindo Risolve di Nonama S D What is that, Mr. Dedalus? The Quaker librarian asked. Was it a celestial phenomenon? A star by night. Stephen said. A pillar of the cloud by day. What's more to speak? Stephen looked at his hat, his stick, his boots. Stephanos, my crown, my sword. His boots are sporting the shape of my feet. Buy a pair. Holes in my socks. Handkerchief, too. You make good use of the name, John Eglinton allowed. Your own name is strange enough. I suppose it explains your fantastical humor. Me, McGee, and Mulligan. Fabulous artificer, uh, the hawk-like man you flew, where to? New Haven, Dieppe, steerage, passenger, Paris and back, Lauping, Icarus, Pater, Ait, sea bedabbled, fallen, weltering, lau lapwing you are, lapwing be. Mr. Best eager quietly lifted his book to say. That's very interesting, because that brother motive, don't you know, we find also in the old Irish myths. Just what you say, the three brothers Shakespeare. In Grimm, too, don't you know, the fairy tales. The third brother that marries the sleeping beauty and wins the best prize. Best of best brothers, good, better, best. The Quaker librarian spring halted near. I should like to know, he said, which bother you. I understand you to suggest there was, a, there was misconduct with one of the brothers. But perhaps I am anticipating? He caught himself in the act, looked at all. Refrained. An attendant from the doorway called, Mr. Leister, Father Deneen wants... Oh, Father Deneen, directly. Swiftly, rectly, creaking, rectly, rectly, he was rectly gone. John Eglinton touched the foil. Come, he said, let us hear what you have to say of Richard and Edmund. You kept them for the last, didn't you? In asking you to remember those two noble kinsmen, Nuncle Richie and Nuncle Edmund... Stephen answered. I feel I'm asking too much, perhaps. A brother is as easily forgotten as uh, an umbrella. Lapwing. Where is your brother? 
Apothecary's Hall, my whetstone, him, then Cranley, Mulligan, now these, speech, speech, but act, act speech. They mock to try you. Act, be acted on. Lap wing. I am tired of my voice, the voice of Esau. My kingdom for a drink. On. You will say those names were already in the chronicles from which he took the stuff of his plays. Why did he take them rather than others? Richard, a whore's son, crookback, misbegotten, makes love to a widowed Anne. What's in a name? Woos and wins her. A whore son, Mary widow, Richard the Conqueror, third brother, came from William the Conquered. The other four acts of that play hang limply from that first. Of all his kings, Richard is the only king unshielded by Shakespeare's reverence, the angel of the world. Why is the underplot of King Lear in which Edmund figures lifted out of Sidney's Arcadia and spatchcocked onto the Celtic legend other than history, older than history? That was Will's way, John Eglinton defended. We should not now combine a Norse saga with an excerpt from a novel by George Meredith. Que voulez-vous? Moore would say. He puts Bohemia on a seacoast and makes Ulysses quote Aristotle. Why, Stephen answered himself, because the theme of the false or the, uh, of, or the usurping or the adulterous brother of or all three in one is to Shakespeare what the poor is not, always with him. The note of banishment, banishment from the heart, banishment from the home, sounds uninterruptedly from the two gentlemen of Verona onward till Prospero breaks his staff, buries it certain fathoms in the earth and drowns his book. It doubles itself in the middle of his life, reflects itself in another, repeats itself, protasis, epitasis, catastasis, catastrophe. It repeats itself again when he is near the grave, when his married daughter Susan, chip of the old block, is accused of adultery. But it was the original sin that darkened his understanding, weakened his will, and left in him a strong inclination to evil. The words are those of my lords, bishops of Maynooth and original sin and, like original sin, committed by another in whose sin he too has sinned. It is between the lines of his last written words. It is petrified on his tombstone, under which her four bones are not to be laid. Age has not withered it. Beauty and peace have not done it away. It is an infinite variety everywhere in the world he has created, in Much Ado About Nothing, twice in As You Like It, in The Tempest, in Hamlet, in Measure for Measure, and in all the other plays which I have not read. He laughed to free his mind from his mind's bondage. Judge Eglinton summed up. The truth is midway, he affirmed. He is the ghost and the prince. He is all in all. He is, Stephen said. The boy of Act One is the mature man of Act Five. All in all. In Cymbeline, in Othello, he is bawd and cuckled. He acts and is acted on. Lover of an ideal or a perversion. Like Jose, he kills the real Carmen. His unremitting intellect is the horn-mad Iago, ceaselessly willing that the moor in him shall suffer. Cuckoo! Cuckoo! Cuck Mulligan clucked lewdly. A word of fear. Dark dome received, reverbed. And, and what a character is Iago, undaunted John Ingleton exclaimed. When all is said, Dumas fils, or is it Dumas père, is right, after God Shakespeare has created most. Man delights him not, nor woman neither, woman, Stephen said. He returns after a life of absence to that spot of earth where he was born, where he has always been man and boy, a silent witness, and there, his journey of life ended, he plants his mulberry tree in the earth, then dies. The motion is ended. Gravediggers bury Hamlet père and Hamlet fille, a king and a prince at last in death, with incidental music. And what, though murdered and betrayed, be wept by all frail tender hearts for Dane or Dubliner, Sorrow for the dead is the only husband for whom they refuse to be divorced. If you like the epilogue, look long on it. Prosperous, Prospero, the good man rewarded. Lizzie, Grandpa's lump of love. And Uncle Richie, 
the bad man taken off by poetic justice to a place where the bad niggers go. Strong curtain. He found in the world without as actual what was in his world within as possible. Maeterlinck says, If Socrates leave his house today, he will find the sage seated on his doorstep. If Judas go forth tonight, it is to Judas his steps will tend. Every life is many days, day after day. We walk through ourselves, meeting robbers, ghosts, giants, old men, young men, wives, widows, brothers in love. But always meeting ourselves. The playwright who wrote the folio of this world and wrote it badly. He gave us light first and then the sun two days later. The Lord of things as they are whom the best, whom the most Roman of Catholics call Dio Boea, hangman God, is doubtless all in all of us, in all <laughs> of us, ostler and butcher and would be bawd and cuckold too. But that in the economy of heaven, foretold by Hamlet, there are no more marriages, glorified man, an androgynous angel, being a wife unto himself. Eureka! Eureka. Buck Mulligan cried. Eureka. Eureka! Suddenly happy, he jumped up and reached in a stride John Engleton's desk. May I, he said, the Lord has spoken to Malachi. He began to scribble on a slip of paper. Take some slips from the counter going out. Those who are married, Mr. Best, thus Harold said, all save one shall live, the rest shall keep as they are. He laughed, unmarried, at Eglinton Johannes, of arts, a bachelor. Unwed, unfancied, where of wiles they finger ponder nightly each his verorium edition of the taming of the shrew. You are a delusion, said Rowley, John Eglinton, Stephen. You have brought us all this way to show us a French triangle. Do you believe your own theory? No. Stephen said promptly. Are you going to write it? Mr. Best asked. You ought to make it a dialogue, don't you know? Like the platonic dialogues, Wilde wrote. John Eckleton doubly smiled. Well, in that case, he said, I don't see why you should expect payment for it since you don't believe it yourself. Dowden believes there is some mystery in Hamlet, but we'll say no more. Er Blebru, the man Piper sent, uh, Piper met in Berlin, who is working up that Rutland theory, believes that the secret is hidden in the Stratford Monument. He's going to visit the present duke, Piper says, and prove to him that his ancestor wrote the plays. It will come as a surprise to his grace, but he believes his theory. I believe, O oh Lord. Help my unbelief. That is, help me to believe, or help me to unbelieve. Who helps to believe? Hugo men, who to unbelieve? Other chap? You are the only contributor to Dana who asks for pieces of silver. Then I don't know about the next number. Fred Ryan wants space for an article on economics. Fred Dream, two pieces of silver he lent me. Tied you over. Economics. For a guinea, Stephen said. You can publish this interview. Buck Mulligan stood up from his laughing scribbling, laughing, and then gravely said, Honeying malice. I called upon the bard Kinch at his summer residence in Upper Mecklenburg Street, and found him deep in the study of the Summa Contra Gentilis, in the company of two gonorrheal ladies, French Nelly and Rosalie, the Colquay whore. He broke away. Come, Kinch, come, wandering, Angus, of the birds. Come, Kinch, you've eaten all we left. I, I will serve you your orts and offals. Stephen rose. Life is many days. This will end. We shall see you tonight, John Anglican said. Notre ami Moore says Malachi Mulligan must be there. Buck Mulligan flaunted his slip in Panama. Monsieur Moore, he said, lecturer on French letters to the youth of Ireland. I'll be there. Come, Kinch, the bards must drink. Can you walk straight? Laughing he. Swill till eleven. Irish night's entertainment. <laughs> lover. Stephen followed a lover. One day in the National Library, we had a discussion. Shakes. After his love back, I followed. I got his guy. Stephen, greeting. Then all the mort followed a lover jester, a well-kempt head, new barbered, out of the vaulted cell into a shattering daylight of no thoughts. What have I learned? Of them? Of me? Walk like Haynes now. The constant reader's room, in the reader's book. Kasha, Boyle, O'Connor, Fitzmorse, Tisdale, Farrell, perhaps his polysyllables. Item. 
Was Hamlet mad? The Quakers paid God Lily with a pristine in-book talk. Oh, please do, sir. I shall be most pleased. Amused Buck Mulligan mused in pleasant murmur with himself, self-nodding. A pleased bottom. The turnstile. Is that... Blue ribboned hat idly writing. What? Looked. The curving balustrade, smooth sliding minkus. Puck mulligan. Panamala hamited. Went step by step, iambing, trolling. John Engleton, my Joe John. Why won't you wed a wife? He sputtered to the air. Oh, the chinless Chinaman. Chin Chong Eglin Tun. He went over to their play box, Haynes and I. The plumber's hall. Our players are creating a new art for Europe, like the Greeks or M. Matterlink. Abbey Theatre. I smell the public sweat of monks. He spat blank. Forgot any more than he forgot the whipping lousy Lucy gave him and left the femme de trente ans. And why no other children born and his first child the girl? After wit, go back. The doer, recluse, still there, he has his cake. And the douse, a youngling, minion of pleasure, Fado's toilable fair hair. Eh, hey, I just, eh, uh, I wanted, I, I forgot, he, uh... <laughs> Longworthy and McCurdy Ackerson was there. Puck Mulligan, footed, feedling, trilling. I hardly, hardly hear, hear the purely, purely cry. cry. Or, or tell me talk as I pass, I pass one by, by before, before my thoughts begin to run on F. McCurdy's Atkinson, the same that had the wooden leg and that filibustering filibeg that never dared to sack his truth. McGee that had a chinless mouth, being afraid to marry on earth, they masturbated for all they were worth. Just on, know thyself. Halted below me, a quizzer looks at me, I halt. Mournful murmur, Buck Mulligan moaned. Singe is left off wearing black to be like nature. Only crows, priests, and English coal are black. A laugh tripped, tripped his over knees. his lips. Longworth is awfully sick, he said. After what you wrote about the old hake Gregory. Oh, you inquisitionish, <laughs> inquisitionish. Oh, you Jew Jesuit, inquisitional drunken Jew Jesuit. She gets you a job on the paper and then you go and slate her drivel to Jesus. Couldn't you do the Yeats touch? He went on and down, moping, chanting, with waving graceful arms. The most beautiful book that has come out of our country in my time, one thinks Homer. He stopped at the stairfoot. I have conceived a play for the murmurs, he said solemnly. The pillared Moorish hall, shadows entwine. Gone the nine men's morse with caps of indices. In sweetly varying voices, Muck, Buck Mulligan read his tablet. Every man, his own wife, or a honeymoon in the hand. He turned her happy patches smirk to Stephen. Saying, saying the disguise I fear I fear is dim, thin, but, but listen listen you read you read Marcado, Marcado. Characters. characters Toby Tostoff Toby Tostoff Paul Pole Crab a Bush Ranger Crab a Bush Ranger Medical Dick and Medical Davy Two birds with one medical stone. Dick and medical Davy. Mother Grogan. Two birds with one stone. A water carrier. Fresh Mother Nelly Grogan. and Rosalie. Water carrier. The Colquay whore. Fresh Nelly and Rosalie. He laughed. The Colquay whore. Lolling a to and fro head. Walking on, followed by Stephen. And mirthfully he told the shadows, souls of men. Oh, the night in the Camden Hall when the daughters of Aaron had to lift their skirts to step over you as you lay in your mulberry-colored, multicolored, multitudinous vomit. The most innocent son of Aaron, Stephen said, for whom they ever lifted them. About to pass through the doorway, feeling one behind, he stood aside. Part. The moment is now. Where then? If Socrates leave his home today, if Judas go forth tonight, why? Why? That lies in space which in which I in time must come to 
inequitably. My will, his will that fronts me, sees between. A man passed out between them, bowing, greeting. Good day again. Good day. Buck Mulligan said. The portico. We are watched the birds for angry. Angus of the birds. They go, they come. Last night I flew, easily flew. Men wandered, street of harlots after. A cream fruit melon he held to me. In, you will see. The, the wandering, wandering Jew. Jew. The wandering Jew. Buck Mulligan Buck whispered. Man. Buck Mulligan whispered. With clowns off. With Did clowns off. Did you see his he eye? He looked upon to lust. He looked upon to lust. After you. After you. I fear, I fear the ancient mariner. I fear oh, the ancient mariner. thou art in peril. Oh, Kinch, thou art in peril. Get, Get thee a breech pad. Manor of Oxenford. Manor of Oxenford. Day, Day. We, wheelbarrow, son over arch of bridge. Son over arch of bridge. A dark, dark back, back went before them. Step of the part. Down, step up hard down, up by the step gateway. Step up hard down, under the portal. 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 They follow, they follow. Offend me still, speak on. Offend me still, speak on. Define the coins of houses that kill their street. No birds. No birds. Frail from the house tops, two plumes of smoke ascending. Pluming. And in a flaw, a softness softly were blown. They followed. Cease to strive. Cease to strive. Cease of the druid priests. Cease of the druid priests. Of Cymbeline. Of Cymbeline. From wide earth and altar. Land, Loud, loose, and, and, and let our crooked smokes climb to their, their nostrils from our blessed altars. End of section nine of Ulysses by James Joyce. Yay! to forging it. Ulysses by James Joyce, section 10A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Hugh McGuire, Kara Schallenberg, and Mike Trevino. Chapter 10 The superior, very reverend John Conmey, S.J., reset his smooth watch in his interior pocket as he came down the presbytery steps. Five to three. Just nice time to walk to Artain. What was that boy's name again? Dignum, yes. Vere dignum et justum est. Brother Swan was the person to see. Mr. Cunningham's letter, yes. Oblige him if possible, good practical Catholic. Useful at mission time. A one-legged sailor, swinging himself onward by lazy jerks of his crutches, growled some notes. He jerked short before the convent of the Sisters of Charity and held out a peaked cap for alms towards the very Reverend John Conmey, S.J. Father Conmey blessed him in the sun, for his purse held, he knew, one silver crown. Father Conmey crossed to Mountjoy Square. He thought, but not for long, of soldiers and sailors whose legs had been shot off by cannonballs, ending their days in some pauper ward, and of Cardinal Wolsey's words. If I had served my God as I had served my king, he would not have abandoned me in my old days. He walked by the tree shade of sunny winking leaves, and towards him come the wife of Mr. David Sheehy, M.P. Very well indeed, father. And you, father? Father Conmey was wonderfully well indeed. He would go to Buxton probably for the waters. And her boys, were they getting on well at Belvedere? Was that so? Father Conmey was very glad indeed to hear that. And Mr. Sheehy himself, still in London. The house was still sitting, to be sure it was. 
Beautiful weather it was, delightful indeed. Yes, it was very probable that Father Bernard Vaughan would come again to preach. Oh, yes, a very great success. A wonderful man, really. Father Conmey was very glad to see the wife of Mr. David Sheehy, M.P., looking so well, and he begged to be remembered to Mr. David Sheedy, M.P. Yes, he would certainly call. Good afternoon, Mrs. Sheehy. Father Conmey doffed his silk hat as he took leave, at the jet beads of her mantilla ink-shining in the sun, and smiled yet again in going. He had cleaned his teeth, he knew, with arcanut paste. Father Conmey walked, and walking, smiled, for he thought on Father Bernard Vaughan's droll and cockney voice. Pilot, why don't you hold back that owling mob? A zealous man, however, really he was, and really did good in his way, beyond a doubt. He loved Ireland, he said, and he loved the Irish. Of good family, too, would one think it? Welsh, were they not? Oh, lest he forget the letter to the father provincial. Father Conmey stropped three little schoolboys on the corner of Mount Joy Square. Yes, they were from Belvedere, the little house. Aha! And were they good boys at school? Oh, that was very good now. And what was his name? Jack Soham. And his name? Gurr. Gallagher. And the other little man? His name was Bruni Lynham. Oh, that was a very nice name to have. Father Conmey gave a letter from his breast to Master Brunny Lynham, and pointed to the red pillar box on the corner of Fitzgibbon Street. But mind you don't post yourself into the box, little man, he said. The boy six-eyed Father Conmey and laughed. Oh, sir. Well, let me see if you can post a letter, Father Conmey said. Master Bruni Lynham ran across the road and put Father Conmey's letter to Father Provincial into the mouth of the bright red letter-box. Father Conmey smiled and nodded and smiled and walked along Mount Joy Square East. Mr. Dennis J. McGinney, professor of dancing and company in silk hat, slate frock coat with silk facings, white kerchief tie, tight lavender trousers, canary gloves and pointed patent boots, walking with grave deportment most respectfully took the curbstone as he passed lady maxwell at the corner of dignam's court was that not mrs mcginnis mrs mcginnis stately silver-haired bowed to father conmey from the farther footpath along which she sailed and father conmey smiled and saluted how did she do a fine carriage she had like mary queen of the scots something and to think she was a pawnbroker well now such a what should he say such a queenly mane Father Conmey walked down Great Charles Street and glanced at the shut-up free church on his left. The Reverend T.R. Green, B.A., Will, D.V., Speak. The incumbent, they called him. He felt it incumbent on him to say a few words. But one should be charitable, invincible ignorance. They acted according to their lights. Father Conmey turned the corner and walked along the north circular road. It was a wonder that there was not a tram line in such an important thoroughfare. Surely there ought to be. A band of satcheled schoolboys crossed from Richmond Street, all raised untidy caps. Father Conmey greeted them more than once, benightingly. Christian brother boys. Father Conmey smelled incense on his right hand as he walked. St. Joseph's Church, Portland Row. For aged and virtuous females, Father Conmey raised his hat to the blessed sacrament virtuous, but occasionally they were also bad-tempered. Near Aldborough House, Father Conmey thought of that spendthrift nobleman, and now it was an office or something. Father Conmey began walking along the North Strand Road and was saluted by Mr. William Gallagher, who stood in the doorway of his shop. Father Conmey saluted Mr. William Gallagher, and perceived the odors that came from bacon flitches and ample cools of butter. He passed Grogan's, the tobacconist, against which newsboards leaned, and told of a dreadful catastrophe in New York. In America, those things were continually happening. Unfortunate people to die like that, unprepared, still an act of perfect contrition. 
Father Conmee went by Daniel Bergen's public house, against the window of which two unlabouring men lounged. They saluted him and were saluted. Father Conmee passed H. J. O'Neill's funeral establishment, where Corny Kelleher totted figures in the daybook, while he chewed a blade of hay. A constable on his beat saluted Father Conmee, and Father Conmee, Conmee saluted the constable. In Uke Setters, the pork butchers, Father Conmee observed pig's pudding, white, black, and red, lying neatly cubed in tubes. Moored under the trees of Charleville Mall, Father Conmee saw a turf barge, a tow horse with pendant head, a bargeman with a hat of dirty straw seated amidships, smoking and staring at a branch of poplar above him. It was idyllic, and Father Conmee reflected on the providence of the Creator who made turf to be in bogs where men might dig it out and bring it to town, and hamlet to make fires in the houses of poor people. On Newcomen Bridge, the very Reverend John Conmee, S.J. of St. Francis Xavier Church, Upper Gardiner Street, stepped on to an outward-bound tram. Of an inward-bound tram stepped the Reverend Nicholas Dudley, C.C. of St. Agatha's Church, North William Street, on to Newcomen Bridge. At Newcomen Bridge, Father Conmee stepped into an outward-bound tram, for he disliked to traverse on foot the dingy way past Mud Island. Father Conmee sat in a corner of the tram car, a blue ticket tucked with care in the eye of one plump kid glove, while four shillings, a sixpence, and five pennings shooted from his other plump glove palm into his purse. Passing the ivory church, he reflected that the ticket inspector usually made his visit when one had carelessly thrown away the ticket. The solemnity of the occupants of the car seemed to Father Conmee excessive for a journey so short and cheap. Father Conmee liked cheerful decorum. It was a peaceful day. The gentleman with glasses opposite Father Conmee had finished explaining and looked down. His wife, Father Conmee supposed, a tiny yawn opened the mouth of the wife of the gentleman with the glasses. She raised her small gloved fist, yawned ever so gently, tip-tapping her small gloved fist on her opening mouth and smiled tinily, sweetly. Father Conmee perceived her perfume in the car. He perceived also that the awkward man at the other side of her was sitting on the edge of the seat. Father Conmee at the altar rails placed the host with difficulty in the mouth of the awkward old man who had the shaky head. At Annesley Bridge the tram halted, and, when it was about to go, an old woman rose suddenly from her place to alight. The conductor pulled the bell straps to stay the car for her. She passed out with her basket and market net, and Father Conmee saw the conductor help her and net the basket down. And Father Conmee thought that, as she was nearly past the end of the penny fare, she was one of those good souls who would always to be told twice, Bless you, my child, and they have been absolved, pray for me. But they had so many worries in life, so many cares, poor creatures. From the hoardings, Mr. Eugene Stratton grinned with thick nigger lips at Father Conmee. Father Conmee thought of the souls of black and brown and yellow men, and of his sermon of St. Peter Calver, S.J., and the African mission, and of the progression, propagation of the faith, and of the millions of black and brown and yellow souls that had not received the baptism of water when their last hour came like a thief in the night. That book by the Belgian Jesuit Le Nom des Élus seemed to Father Conmee a reasonable plea. Those were millions of human souls created by God in his own likeness, to whom the faith had not D.V. been brought. But they were God's soul created by God. It seemed to Father Conmee a pity that they should be lost, a waste, if one might say. At the house road, Father Conmee alighted, was saluted by the conductor, and saluted his term. The Malahide road was quiet. It pleased Father Conmee, road and name. The joy bells were ringing in gay Malahide. Lord Talbot de Malahide, intermediate 
hereditary lord admiral of Malahide and the seas adjoining. Then came the call to arms, and she was maid, wife, and widow in one day. Those were old, worldish days, loyal times in joyous townlands, old times in the barony. Father Conmey, walking, thought of his little book, Old Times in the Barony, of the book that might be written about Jesuit houses and of Mary Rochford, daughter of Lord Molesworth, first countess of Belvedere. A listless lady, no more young, walked along the shore of Loch Enel. Mary, first countess of Belvedere, listlessly walking in the evening, not startled when an otter plunged. Who could know the truth? Not the jealous Lord Belvedere, not her confessor, if she had not committed adultery fully. Eaculatio seminis inter vas naturale mulieris, with her husband's brother. Hmm. She would half confess if she had not all sinned as women did, only God knew, and she and he, her husband's brother. Father Conmey thought of the tyrannous incontinence needed, however, for men's race on earth, and of the ways of God which were not our own ways. Don John Conmey walked and moved in times of yore. He was humane and honored there. He bore in mind secrets confessed, and he smiled at smiling noble faces in a beeswax drawing room, sealed with full fruit clusters. And the hands of a bride and of a bridegroom, noble to noble, were empalmed by Don John Conmey. It was a charming day. The lich gate of a field showed Father Conmey breadths of cabbages curtsying to him with ample underleaves. The sky showed him a flock of small white clouds going slowly down the wind. Mutoner, the French said. A homely and just word. Father Conmey, reading his office, watched a flock of muttoning clouds over Rath Coffee. His thin socked ankles were tickled by the stubble of Conglo's field. He walked there reading in the evening and heard the cries of the boys' lines at their play, young cries in the quiet evening. He was their rector, his reign was mild. Father Conmey drew off his gloves and took his redredged breviary out. An ivory bookmark told him the page, Nones. He should have read that before lunch, but Lady Maxwell had come. Father Conmey read in secret Pater and Ave and crossed his breast, Deus in auditorium. He walked calmly and read mutely the Nones, walking and reading till he came to rest in Beati Immaculati, Principium Verborum Tuorum Veritas, in Eternum Omnia Uisia Institutiae Tue. A flushed young man came from a gap of a hedge, and after him came a young woman with wild nodding daisies in her hand. The young man raised his hat abruptly, the young woman abruptly bent and with slow care detached from her light skirt a clinging twig. Father Conmey blessed both gravely and turned a thin page of his breviary. Sin, principes persecuti sunt me gratis, eta verbis tuis formidavit cor meum. Corney Kelleher closed his long day-book and glanced with his drooping eye at a pine coffin-lid sentried in a corner. He pulled himself erect, went to it, and, spinning it on its axle, viewed its shape and brass furnishings. Shoeing his blade of hay, he laid the coffin-lid by and came to the doorway. There he tilted his hat-brim to give shade to his eyes and leaned against the door-case looking idly out. Father John Comney stepped out, stepped into Dolly Mount Tram on Newcomen Bridge. Corney Kelleher locked his large-footed boots and gazed, his hat down-tilted, chewing his blade of hay. Constable 57C, on his belt, on his beat, stood to pass the time of day. That's a fine day, Mr. Kelleher. Aye, Corney Kelleher said. It's very close, the constable said. 
Corny Kelleher sped, a silent jet of hay juice arching from his mouth while a generous white arm from a window in Eccles Street flung forth a coin. "'What's the best news?' he asked. "'I seen that particularly party last evening,' the constable said, with bated breath. A one-legged sailor crutched himself round McConnell's corner, skirting Rabiotti's ice cream cart, and jerked himself up Eccles Street. Towards Larry O'Rourke, in shirt sleeves in his door in his doorway, he growled unamiably, For England! He swung himself violently forward past Katie and Booty Dedalus, halted and growled, Home and Beauty. J. J. O'Malley's white careworn face was told that Mr. Lambert was in the warehouse with a visitor. A stout lady stopped, took a copper coin from her purse, and dropped it into the cap held out to her. The sailor grumbled thanks and glanced sourly at the unheeding windows, sank his head and swung himself forward four strides. He halted and growled angrily, For England! Two barefoot urchins sucking long licorice laces halted near him, gaping at his stump with their yellow slobbered mouths. He swung himself forward in vigorous jerks, halted, lifted his head towards a window and bayed deeply, Home and beauty! The gay, sweet chirping, whistling within, went on, went on a bar or two, ceased. The blind of the window was drawn aside. A card, unfurnished apartment, slipped from the sash and fell. A plump, bare, generous arm shone, was seen, held forth from a white petticoat, bodice, and taut shift straps. A woman's hand flung forth a coin over the area railings. It fell on the path. One of the urchins ran to it, picked it up, and dropped it into the minstrel's cap, saying, There, sir. Katie and Booty Dedalus shoved in the door of the closed, steaming kitchen. Did you put in the books? Booty asked. Maggie at the range rammed down a grayish mass beneath bubbling suds, twice with her pot stick, and wiped her brow. They wouldn't give anything on them, she said. Father Kami walked through Klongau's fields, his thin-socked ankles tickled by stubble. Where did you try? Booty asked. McGuinness's. Booty stamped her foot and threw her satchel on the table. Bad cess to her, big face, she cried. Katie went to the rang and peered with squinting eyes. What's in the pot? she asked. Shirts, Maggie said. Booty cried angrily. Crikey! Is there nothing for us to eat? Katie, lifting the kettle lid, in a pad of her stained skirt, asked, And what's in this? A heavy fume gushed in answer. Pea soup, Maggie said. Where did you get it? Katie asked. Sister Mary Patrick, Maggie said. The lackey rang his bell. Barang! Booty sat down at the table and said hungrily, Give it us here. Give us it here. <laughs> Maggie poured yellow thick soup from the kettle into a bowl. Katie, Sitting opposite Booty, said quietly, as her fingertip lifted to her mouth random crumbs. A good job we have that much. Where's Dilly? Gone to meet father, Maggie said. Booty, breaking big chunks of bread into the yellow soup, added, Our father who art not in heaven. Maggie, pouring yellow soup in Katie's bowl, exclaimed, Booty, for shame. A skiff, a crumpled th throwaway, Elijah is coming, rode lightly down the Liffey, under Loop Line Bridge, shooting the rapids where water chafed around the bridge piers, sailing eastward past hulls and anchor chains, between the Custom House Old Dock and George's Quay. The blonde girl in Thornton's bedded the wicker basket with rustling fibre. Blazes Boylan handed her the bottle swathed in pink tissue paper and a small jar. "'Put these in first, will you?' he said. Yes, sir, the blonde girl said, and the fruit is on top. That'll do, game ball, Blazes Boylan said. She bestowed fat pears neatly, head by tail, and among them ripe, shame-faced peaches. Blazes Boylan walked here and there in new tan shoes about the fruit-smelling shop, lifting fruits, young, juicy, crinkled and plump red tomatoes, sniffing smells. H.E.L.Y.'s filed before him, tall white-hatted, 
past Tangier Lane, plodding toward their goal. He turned suddenly from a chip of strawberries, drew a gold watch from his fob, and held it at its chain's length. "'Can you send them by tram, now?' A dark-backed figure under merchant's arch scanned books on the hawker's car. "'Certainly, sir. Is it in the city?' "'Oh, yes,' Blazes Boylan said. Ten minutes.' The blonde girl handed him a docket and pencil. "'Will you write the address, sir?' Blazes Boylan at the counter wrote and pushed the docket to her. "'Send it at once, will you?' he said. "'It's for an invalid.' "'Yes, sir. I will, sir.' Blazes Boylan rattled merry money in his trousers pocket. "'What's the damage?' he asked. The blonde girl's slim fingers reckoned the fruits. Blazes Boylan looked into the cut of her blouse, a young pullet. He took a red carnation from the tall stem-glass. "'This for me?' he asked gallantly. The blonde girl glanced sideways at him, got up regardless, with his tie a bit crooked, blushing. "'Yes, sir,' she said. Bending archly, she reckoned again fat pears and blushing peaches. Blazes Boylan looked in her blouse with more favour, the stalk of the red flower between his smiling teeth. "'May I say a word to your telephone, Missy?' he asked roguishly. "'Ma!' Almidano Artifoni said. He gazed over Stefan's shoulder at Goldsmith's knobby paw. Two car two carfuls of tourists passed slowly, their women sitting four, gripping frankly the hand-rests. Pale faces. Men's arms frankly round their stunted forms. They looked from Trinity to the blind-columned porch of the Bank of Ireland, where pigeons rococooed. "'Ancio ho avuti di queste idee,' Almidano Artifoni said. Quando ero giovine com lei, e poi mi sono convinti che il mondo è una bestia, e peccato, perce la sua voce, sarebbe un cep cespite di rendita via, invece lei si sacrifica. Sacrificio incruento, Stefan said, smiling, swaying his ash plant in slow swing swung from its midpoint lightly. That would be Stephen, wouldn't it? Speriamo, the round, mustachioed face said pleasantly. Ma diaretta a me, si rifletta. By the stern stone hand of Grattan, bidding halt, an inchicore tram unloaded straggling highland soldiers of a band. Si riflettero, Stephen said, glancing down the solid trouser leg. Ma sul serio, eh? Almidano Artifoni said. His heavy hand took Stephen's firmly. Human eyes. They gazed curiously an instant, and turned quickly towards a dalky tram. Eccolo, Almidano Artifoni said in friendly haste. Venga a trovarmi e ci pensi. Adio, caro. Arrivederla, maestro, Stephen said, raising his hat when his hand was freed. E grazie. Dice, Almidano Artifoni said. Artifano said. Scusi, eh? Tante belle cose. Almidano Artifoni, holding up a baton of rolled music as a signal, trotted on stout trousers after the dalky tram. In vain he trotted, signaling in vain among the rout of bare-kneed gillies smuggling implements of music through Trinity Gates. Miss Dunn hid the Capel Street Library copy of the, Wom the Woman in White far back in her drawer, and rolled a sheet of gaudy notepaper into her typewriter. Too much mystery business in it. Is he in love with that one, Marion? Change it and get another by Mary Cecil Hay. The disc shot down the groove, wobbled a while, ceased, and ogled them. Six. Miss Dunn clicked on the keyboard. 16 June, 1904 Five tall white-hatted sandwich men between Monypenny's corner and the slab where Wolf Tone's statue was not, 
eeled themselves, turning H-E-L-Ys, and plodded back as they had come. Then she stared at the large poster of Marie Kendall, charming soubrette and listlessly lolling, scribbled on the jotter sixteens and capital S's, mustard hair and dauby cheeks. She's not nice-looking, is she? The way she is holding up her bit of a skirt. Wonder will that fellow be at the band to-night? If I could get that dressmaker to make a concertina skirt like Susie Nagel's, they kick out grand. Shannon and all the boat club swells never took his eyes off her. Hope to goodness he won't keep me here till seven. The telephone rang rudely by her ear. Hello? Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'll ring them up after five. Only those two, sir, for Belfast and Liverpool. All right, sir. Then I can go after six if you're not back. A quarter after. Yes, sir. Twenty-seven and six, I'll tell him. Yes. One, seven, six. She scribbled three figures on an envelope. Mr. Boylan, hello. That gentleman from Sport was in looking for you. Mr. Lenahan, yes. He said he'll be in the Ormond at four. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'll ring them up after five. Two pink faces turned in the flare of the tiny torch. Who's that? Ned Lambert asked. Is that Crotty? Ringabella and Crosshaven, a voice replied, groping for foothold. Hello, Jack, is that yourself? Ned Lambert said, raising in salute his pliant lath among the flickering arches. Come on, mind your steps there. The vesta in the clergyman's uplifted hand consumed itself in a long soft flame and was let fall. At their feet its red speck died, and mouldy air closed round them. "'How interesting!' a refined accent said in the gloom. "'Yes, sir,' Ned Lambert said heartily. "'We are standing in the historic council chamber of St. Mary's Abbey, where Silken Thomas proclaimed himself a rebel in 1534. This is the most historic spot in all Dublin. Oh, Madden Burke is going to write something about it one of these days. The old Bank of Ireland was over the way till the time of the Union, and the original Jews' temple was here too before they built their synagogue over in Adelaide Road. You were never here before, Jack, were you? No, Ned. He rode down through Dame Walk, the refined accent said, if my memory serves me. The mansion of the Kildares was in Thomas Court. That's right, Ned Lambert said. That's quite right, sir. If you will be so kind, then, the clergyman said, the next time to allow me, perhaps. Certainly, Ned Lambert said. Bring the camera whenever you like. I'll get those bags cleared away from the windows. You can take it from here or from here. In the still faint light he moved about, tapping with his lath the pile of seed bags and points of vantage on the floor. From a long face a beard and gaze hung on a chessboard. I'm deeply obliged, Mr. Lambert, the clergyman said. I won't trespass on your valuable time. You're welcome, sir, Ned Lambert said. Drop in whenever you like. Ni next week, say? Can you see? Yes, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Lambert. Very pleased to have met you. Pleasure's mine, sir, Ned Lambert answered. He followed his guest to the outlet, and then whirled his lath away among the pillars. With J. J. O'Malloy he came forth slowly into Mary's Abbey, where draymen were loading floats with sacks of carob and palm-nut meal, O'Connor, Wexford. He stood to read the card in his hand. The Reverend Hugh C. Love, Rathcoffey, present address, St. Michael's, Salins. Nice young chap he is. He's writing a book about the Fitzgeralds, he told me. He's well up in history, faith. The young woman, with slow care, detached from her light skirt a clinging twig. "'I thought you were at a new gunpowder plot,' J. J. O'Malloy said. Ned Lambert cracked his fingers in the air. "'God!' he cried. "'I forgot to tell him that one about the Earl of Kildare after he set fire to Cashel Cathedral. You know that one? I'm bloody sorry I did it,' says he, "'but I declare to God I thought the Archbishop was inside. He mightn't like it, though. What?' God, I'll tell him anyhow. That was the great Earl, the Fitzgerald Moore. Hot members they were, all of them, the Geraldines. The horses he passed started nervously under their slack harness. 
he slapped a piebald haunch quivering near him and cried, "'Whoa, Sonny!' He turned to J. J. O'Malloy and asked, "'Well, Jack, what is it? What's the trouble? Wait a while. Hold hard.' With gaping mouth and head far back he stood still and, after an instant, sneezed loudly. Chow, he said. "'Blast you!' "'The dust from those sacks,' J. J. O'Malloy said politely. "'No!' Ned Lambert gasped. "'I caught a cold night before. "'Blast your soul! Night before last! "'And there was a hell of a lot of draught!' He held his handkerchief ready for the coming. "'I was, this morning. "'Poor little... what do you call him? "'Cha! Mother of Moses!' Tom Rochford took the top disc from the pile he clasped against his claret waistcoat. See, he said, say it's turn six. In here, see. Turn now on. He slid it into the left slot for them. It shot down the groove, wobbled a while, ceased, ogling them. Six. Lawyers of the past, haughty, pleading, beheld pass from the consolidated taxing office to Nisi Prius Court, Richie Golding carrying the cost-bag of Golding, Collis, and Ward, and heard rustling from the Admiralty Division of King's Bench to the Court of Appeal an elderly female with false teeth, smiling incredulously, and a black silk skirt of great amplitude. "'See,' he said, "'see now, the last one I put in is over here, turns over. The impact. Leverage. See?" He showed them the rising column of discs on the right. "'Smart idea,' Nosy, fin Nosy Flynn said, snuffling. "'So a fellow coming in late can see what turn is on and what turns are over.' "'See?' Tom Rochford said. He slid in a disc for himself and watched it shoot, wobble, ogle, stop. Four. Turn now on. "'I'll see him now in the Ormond,' Lenahan said, and sound him. "'One good turn deserves another.' "'Do,' Tom Rochford said. "'Tell him I'm boiling with impatience.' "'Good night,' McCoy said abruptly. "'When you two begin.' Nosy Flynn stooped towards the lever, snuffling at it. "'But how does it work here, Tommy?' he asked. "'Turaloo,' Lenahan said. "'See you later.' He followed McCoy out across the tiny square of Crampton Court. "'He's a hero,' he said simply. "'I know,' McCoy said. "'The drain, you mean?' "'Drain?' Lenahan said. It was down a manhole. They passed Dan Lowry's music hall, where Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, smiled on them from a poster, a dauby smile. Going down the path of Sycamore Street beside the Empire Music Hall, Lenahan showed McCoy how the whole thing was. One of those manholes like a bloody gas-pipe, and there was the poor devil stuck down in it half choked with sewer gas. Down went Tom Rochford anyhow, bookie's vest and all, with the rope round him. And be damned, but he got the rope round the poor devil and the two were hauled up. The act of a hero, he said. At the Dolphin they halted to allow the ambulance car to gallop past them for Jervis Street. "'This way,' he said, walking to the right. "'I want to pop into Linham's to see Scepter's starting price. What's the time by your gold watch and chain?' McCoy peered into Marcus Tertius Moses's sombre office, then at O'Neill's clock. "'After three, he said, "'who's riding her?' "'Oh, Madden,' Lenahan said. And a game filly she is. While he waited in Temple Bar, McCoy dodged a banana peel with gentle pushes of his toe from the path to the gutter. Fellow might damn easy get a nasty fall there, coming along tight in the dark. The gates of the drive opened wide to give egress to the viceregal cavalcade. Even money, Lenahan said, returning. I knocked against Bantam Lyons in there, going to back a bloody horse someone gave him that hasn't an earthly. Through here. They went up the steps and under Merchant's arch. A dark-backed figure scanned books on the hawker's cart. There he is, Lenahan said. Wonder what he is buying, McCoy said, glancing behind. Leopoldo, or the bloom is on the rye, Lenahan said. 
"'He's dead nuts on sales,' McCoy said. "'I was with him one day, and he bought a book from an old one in Liffey Street for two bob. There were fine plates in it worth double the money, the stars and the moon and comets with long tails. Astronomy it was about.' Linehan laughed. "'I'll tell you a damn good one about comets' tails,' he said. "'Come over in the sun.' They crossed to the metal bridge and went along Wellington Quay by the river wall. Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam came out of Mangan's, late Fahrenbach's, carrying a pound and a half of pork steaks. "'There was a big spread out at Glencree Reformatory,' Lenahan said eagerly. "'The annual dinner, you know, boiled shirt affair. The Lord Mayor was there, Val Lill in it was, and Sir Charles Cameron and Dan Dawson spoke, and there was music.' Bartell Darcy sang, and Benjamin Dollard. "'I know,' McCoy broke in. "'My missus sang there once.' "'Did she?' Linehan said. A card, Unfurnished Apartments, reappeared on the window-sash of Number 7 Eccles Street. He checked his tail a moment, but broke out in a wheezy laugh. "'But wait till I tell you,' he said. "'Della Hunt of Camden Street had the catering, and yours truly was chief bottle-washer.' Bloom and the wife were there, lashings of stuff we put up, port wine and sherry and caracoa, to which we did ample justice. Fast and furious it was. After liquids came solids, cold joints galore and mince pies. I know, McCoy said, the year the missus was there. Lenahan linked his arm warmly. But wait till I tell you, he said. We had a midnight lunch, too, after all the jollification, and when we sallied forth it was blue o'clock the morning after the night before. Coming home it was a gorgeous winter's night on the Featherbed Mountain. Bloom and Chris Callanan were on one side of the car, and I was with the wife on the other. We started singing glees and duets, low the early beam of morning. She was well primed with a good load of Delahunt's port under her belly-band. Every jolt the bloody car gave I had her bumping up against me. Hell's delights! She has a fine pair, God bless her, like that! He held his caved hands a cubit from him, frowning. I was tucking the rug under her and settling her boa all the time, know what I mean? His hands moulded ample curves of air. He shut his eyes tight in delight, his body shrinking, and blew a sweet chirp from his lips. "'The lad stood to attention anyhow,' he said with a sigh. "'She's a gamey mare, and no mistake. "'Bloom was pointing out all the stars and the comets in the heavens to Chris Callanan and the Jarvie, "'the great bear and Hercules and the dragon and the whole jing-bang lot. "'But by God I was lost, so to speak, in the Milky Way. "'He knows them all, Faith. "'At last she spotted a weeny-weeshy one miles away. "'And what star is that, Poldy?' says she. "'By God, she had Bloom cornered. "'That one, is it?' says Chris Callanan. "'Sure, that's only what you might call a pinprick. "'By God, he wasn't far wide of the mark.' "'Lenahan stopped and leaned on the river wall, "'panting with soft laughter. "'I'm weak,' he gasped. "'McCoy's white face smiled about it at instants and grew grave. "'Lenahan walked on again. "'He lifted his yachting cap and scratched his hind head rapidly.' He glanced sideways in the sunlight at McCoy. "'He's a cultured all-round man, Bloom is,' he said seriously. "'He's not one of your common or garden, you know. There's a touch of the artist about old Bloom.' Mr. Bloom turned over idly pages of the awful disclosures of Maria Monk, and then of Aristotle's masterpiece, crooked botched print, plates, infants cuddled in a ball— in blood-red wombs like livers of slaughtered cows, lots of them like that, at this moment all over the world, all budding with their skulls to get out of it, child-born every minute somewhere. Mrs. Purefoy. He laid both books aside and glanced at the third, Tales of the Ghetto, by Leopold von Sacher Massok. That I had, he said, pushing it by. The shopman let two volumes fall on the counter. Them are two good ones, he said. Onions of his breast, breath came across the counter out of his ruined mouth. He bent to make a bundle of the other books, hugged them against his unbuttoned waistcoat, and bore them off behind the dingy curtain. 
On O'Connell Bridge, many persons observed the grave deportment and gay apparel of Mr. Dennis J. McGinney, professor of dancing and company. Mr. Bloom alone looked at the titles. Fair Tyrants by Lane James Lovebirch. Know the kind, that is. Had it? Yes. He opened it. Thought so. A woman's voice behind the dingy curtain. Listen. The man. No. She wouldn't like that much. Got her at once. He read the other titles. Sweets of Sin. More in her line. Let us see. He read where his finger opened. All the dollar bills her husband gave her were spent in the stores on wondrous gowns and costliest frillies. For him. For Raoul. Yes, this, here, try. Her mouth glued on his in a luscious, voluptuous kiss while his hands felt for the opulent curves inside her déshabillé. Yes, take this, the end. You are late, he spoke hoarsely, eyeing her with suspicious glare. The beautiful woman threw off her stable-trimmed wrap, displaying her queenly shoulders and heaving and bon point. An imperceptible smile played round her perfect lips as she turned to him calmly. Mr. Bloom read again, the beautiful woman. Warmth showered gently over him, cowing his flesh. Flesh yielded amid rumpled clothes, whites of eyes swooning up. His nostrils arched themselves for prey, melting breast ointments for him, for Raoul, armpits onion, oniony sweat. Fish gluey slime, her heaving umbon point. Feel, press, crished sulphur dung of lions. Young, young. An elderly female, no more young, left the building of the courts of Chancery King's Bents at Chequer, and common pleas having heard in the Lord Chancellor's court the case in lunacy of Potterton. In the admirability divisions of the summons, ex parte motion of the owners of Lady Cairns versus the owners of Barque Mona, in the Court of Appeal, reservation of judgment in the case of Harvey versus the Ocean Accident and Guarantee Corporation. Flemmy coughs shook the air of the bookshop, bulging out the dingy curtains. The shopman's uncombed grey head came out and his unshaven reddened face coughing. He raked his throat rudely, spat phlegm on the floor. He put his boot on what he had spat, wiping the sole along it, and bent, showing a raw skin crown, scantily haired. Mr. Bloom beheld it. Mastering his troubled breath, he said, I'll take this one. The shopman lifted eyes, bleared with old room. Sweets of sin, he said, tapping on it. That's a good one. End of of Ulysses section 10a Ulysses by James Joyce section 10b this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org the lackey by the door of Dylan's auction rooms shook his handbell twice and viewed himself in the chalked mirror of the cabinet. Dilly Dedalus, listening in the curbstone, heard the beats of the bell and the cries of the auctioneer within. Four and nine, those lovely curtains, five shillings, cosy curtains, selling new at two guineas, any advance on five shillings, going for five shillings. The lackey lifted his handbell and shook it. Barang! Bang of the last lap bell spurred the half-time wheelmen to their spirit. J. A. Jackson, W. E. Wiley, A. Monroe, H. T. Gahan. Their stretched necks wagging negotiated the curve by the college library. Mr. Dedalus, trudging a long mustache, came round from William's row. He halted near his daughter. It's time for you, she said. Stand up straight for the love of Lord Jesus, Mr. Dedalus said. Are you trying to imitate your uncle John, the coronet player, head upon shoulders? Melancholy God. Dilly shrugged her shoulders. Mr. Dedalus placed his hands on them and held them back. Stand up straight, girl, he said. You'll get curvature of the spine. Do you know what you look like? He let his head sink suddenly down and forward, hunching his shoulders and drooping his under jaw. Give it up, father, Dilly said. All the people are looking at you. 
Mr. Dedalus drew himself upright and tugged again at his moustache. Did you get any money? Dilly asked. Where would I get money? Mr. Dedalus said. There is no one in Dublin would lend me fourpence. You got some, Dilly said, looking in his eyes. How do you know that? Mr. Dedalus asked, his tongue in his cheek. Mr. Kernan, pleased with the order he had booked, walked boldly along James Street. I know you did, Dilly answered. Were you in the Scotch house now? I was not then, Mr. Didalus said, smiling. Was it the little nuns taught you to be so saucy? Here, he handed her a shilling. See if you can do anything with that, he said. I suppose you got five, Dilly said. Give me more of that. Wait a while, Mr. Dedalus said, threateningly. You're like the rest of them, aren't you? An insolent pack of little bitches since your poor mother died. But wait a while. You'll get a short shrift and a long day for me, low black guardism i'm going to get rid of you wouldn't care if i was stretched out stiff he's dead the man upstairs is dead he left her and walked on dilly followed quickly and pulled his coat well what is it he said stopping the racky lackey rang his bell behind their backs barang curse your bloody blatant soul mr dedalus cried turning on him the lackey aware of comment shook the lolling clapper of his bell but feebly bang Mr. Dedalus stared at him. Watch him, he said. It's instructive. I wonder will he allow us to talk. You got more than that, Father, Dilly said. I'm going to show you a little trick, Mr. Dedalus said. I'll leave you all where Jesus left the Jews. Look, that's all I have. I got two shillings from Jack Power and I spent twopence for a shave for the funeral. He drew forth a handful of copper coins nervously. Can't you look for some money somewhere, Dilly said? Mr. Dedalus thought and nodded. I will, he said gravely. I looked all along the gutter in O'Connell Street. I'll try this one now. You're very funny, Dilly said, grinning. Here, Mr. Dedalus said, handing her two pennies. Get a glass of milk for yourself and a bun or something. I'll be home shortly. He put the other coins in his pocket and started to walk on. The vice-regal cavalcade passed, greeted by obsequious policemen out of Parkgate. I'm sure you have another shilling, Dilly said. The lackey banged loudly. Mr. Dedalus, amid the din, walked off, murmuring to himself with a pursing, mincing mouth. The little nuns, nice little things, oh, sure, they wouldn't do anything. Oh, sure, they wouldn't really. Is it little sister Monica? From the sundial towards James's gate walked Mr. Kernan, pleased with the order he had booked for Pulbrook Robertson, boldly along James's street past Shackleton's offices. Got round him all right. How do you do, Mr. Crimmins? First rate, sir. I was afraid you might be up in your other establishment in Pimlico. How are things going? Just keeping alive. Lovely weather we are having. Yes, indeed. Good for the country. Those farmers are always grumbling. I'll take a thimbleful of your best gym, Mr. Crimmins. Small gin, sir. Yes, sir. Terrible affair, that General Sulcum explosion. Terrible, terrible. A thousand casualties. And heart-rending scenes. Men trampling down women and children. Most brutal thing. What do they say was the cause? Spontaneous combustion. Most scandalous revelation. Not a single lifeboat would float and the fire hose all burst. What I can't understand is how the inspectors ever allowed a boat like that. Now you are talking straight, Mr. Crimmins. You know why? Palm oil. Is that a fact? Without a doubt. Well, now, look at that. In America, they say, is the land of the free. I thought we were bad here. I smiled at him. America, I said quietly, just like that. What is it? The sweepings of every country, including our own. Isn't that true? That's a fact. Graft, my dear sir, well, of course, there's plenty of money going. There's always someone to pick it up. Saw him looking at my frock coat dress, does it? Nothing like a dressy appearance. Bowls them over. Hello, Simon, Father Crawley said. How are things? Hello, Bob, old man, Mr. Dedalus answered, stopping. Mr. Kernan halted and preened himself before the sloping mirror of Peter Kennedy, hairdresser. Stylish coat, beyond a doubt. Scott of Dawson Street. Well worth the half-sovereign I gave Neary for it. Never built under three guineas. Fits me down to the ground. Some Kildare Street Club toff had it, probably. John Mulligan, the manager of Hibernian Bank, gave me a very sharp eye yesterday on Carlisle Bridge, as if he remembered me. Aha! Must dress the character of those fellows, knight of the road, gentlemen. And now, Mr. Crimmins... 
May we have the honour of your custom again, sir, the cup that cheers but not inebriates, as the old saying has it. North Wall and Sir John Rogerson's K, with hulls and anchor chains, sailing westward, sailed by a skiff, a crumpled throw-ray, rocked on the ferry wash, Elijah is coming. Mr. Kernan glanced in farewell at his image, high colour, of course grizzled moustache. Returned Indian officer, bravely he bore his stumpy body forward on spatted feet, squaring his shoulders. Is that Lambert's brother over the way, Sam? What? Yes. He's like it as damn it. No, the windscreen of the motor car in the sun there. Just a flash like that. Damn like him. Ahem. Hot spirit of jun juniper juice warmed his vitals in his breath good drop of gin that was his frock tails winked in bright sunshine to his fat strut down there emmett was hanged drawn and quartered greasy black rope dogs licked the blood off the street when the lord lieutenant's wife drove by in her naughty let me see is he buried in saint mich mickens oh no there was a midnight burial in glasnevin corpse brought in through a secret door in the wall. Dignam is there now. Went out in a puff. Well, well, better turn down here. Make a detour. Mr. Kernan turned and walked down the slope of Watling Street by the corner of Guinness's visitor's waiting room. Outside the Dublin Distillery's company stores, an outside ear without fare or Jarvie stood. The reins knotted to the wheel. Damn dangerous thing some tipperary bosthoon endangering the lives of the citizens runaway horse dennis breen with his tomes weary of having waited an hour in john henry menton's office led his wife over a connell bridge bound for the office of messrs collis and ward mr kernan approached island street times of the troubles must ask ned lambert to lend me those reminiscences of john uh, jonah barrington when you look back on it all now, a kind of retrospective arrangement. Gaming at dailies, no card sharping then. One of these fellows got his hand nailed to the table by a dagger. Somewhere here, Lord Edward Fitzgerald escaped from Major Sir. Stables behind Moira House. Damn good gin that was. Fine, dashing young nobleman, good stock, of course. That ruffian, that sham squire with his violet gloves, gave him away. Of course, they were on the wrong side. They rose in dark and evil days. Fine poem, that is, Ingram. They were gentlemen. Ben Dollard does sing that ballad touchingly, masterly rendition. At the siege of Ross did my father fall. A cavalcade, an easy trot along Pembroke Cay, passed, outriders leaping, leaping in there, in their saddles, frock coats, cream sunshades. Mr. Kernan hurried forward, blowing pursily, his excellently too bad. Just missed that by a hair. Damn it, what a pity. Stephen Dedalus watched through the webbed window, the lapidary's fingers prove a time-dulled chain. Dust webbed the window and the show trays. Dust darkened the toiling fingers with their vulture nails. Dust slept on dull coils, bronze and silver, lozenges of cinnabar, on rubies, leprous and wine-dark stones. Born all in dark, wormy earth, cold specks of fire, evil lights shining in the darkness. Where fallen archangels flung the stars of their brows, Muddy swine snouts, hands root and root, gripe and rest them. She dances in a foul gloom where gum burns with garlic. A sailor man, rust bearded, sips from a beaker, rum and eyeser. A long, sea fed, silent rut. She dances, capers, wagging her sowish haunches and her hips, on her gross belly flapping a ruby egg. Old Russell, with a smeared chamois rag, burnished his, again his gem turned it and held it at the point of his Moses's beard, grandfather ape gloating on a stolen hoard, and you who rest old images from the burial earth, the brain-sick words of sophist, anti 
this seems. A lore of drugs, orient and immortal wheat standing from everlasting to everlasting. Two old women, fresh from their whiff of the briny trudge through Irish town along London Bridge Road, one with sanded umbrella, one with a midwife's bag in which eleven cockles rolled, the whir of flapping leather bands and hum of dynamos from the powerhouse urged Stephen to be on. Beingless beings, stop, throb always without you and throb always within. Your heart you sing of, I between them, where? Between two roaring worlds where they swirl, I shatter them, one and both. But stun myself too in the blow, shatter me, you who can. Bod and butcher were the words I say. Not yet a while, look around. Yes, quite true. Very large and wonderful in keeps famous time, you say, right, sir? A Monday morning, twas so indeed. Stephen went down Bedford Row, the handle of the ash clacking against his shoulder blade. In Clohissy's window, a faded 1860 print of Heenan boxing sayers held his eye. Staring backers with square hats stood round the rope prize ring. The heavyweights in light loincloths proposed gently to each other his bulbous fist. And there throbbing heroes' hearts. He turned and halted by the slanted book cart. Two pence each, the huckster said. Four for six pence. Tattered pages of the Irish beekeeper. Life and miracles of the cure a of arts pocket guide to killarney i might find here one of my pawn school prizes stefano didolo alumno optimo palman ferenti father conmi having read his little hours walked through the hamlet of don carney murmuring vespers binding too good probably what is this eighth and ninth book of Mo moses secret of all secrets seal of king david Thumbled pages, rid and red. Who has passed before me? How to soften chapped hands, recipe for white wine vinegar, how to win a woman's love. For me this, say the following talisman three times with hand folded. Say el yilo nebracar feminum amor me solo, sanctus amen. Who wrote this? charms and invocations of the most blessed abbot peter salanca to all true believers divulge as good as any other abbot's charms as mumbling joachim's down bally noddle or we'll wool your wool what are you doing here stephen dilly's high shoulders and shabby dress shut the book quick don't let's see what are you doing stephen said a Stuart face of none such Charles, lank locks falling at its sides. It glowed as she crouched, feeding the fire with broken boots. I told her of Paris, late lie abed under a quilt of overcoats, fingering a pinchbeck bracelet, Dan Kelly's token. Nebracadaba feminum. What have you there? Stephen asked. I bought it from the other cart for a penny, Dilly said, laughing nervously. Is it any good? My eyes say she has. Do others see me so? Quick, far, and daring, shadow of my mind. He took the coverless book from her hand. Chardinal's French primer. What did you buy that for, he said, to learn French? She nodded, reddening, and closed tight her lips. Show no surprise, quite natural. Here, Stephen said, it's all right. Mind Maggie doesn't pawn it on you. I suppose all my books are gone. Some, Dilly said, we had to. She is drowning. Agenbite, save her. Agenbite, all against us. She will drown me with her eyes and hair, lank coils of seaweed hair round me, my heart, my soul. Salt, green, death, we. Agenbite of Inwit. Inwit's Agenbite, misery. Misery. Hello, Simon, Father Crowley said. How are things? Hello, Bob, old man, Mr. Dedalus answered, stopping. They clasped hands loudly outside Reddy and daughters. Father Cowley brushed his mustache off and downward with a scooping hand. What's the best news? Mr. Dedalus said. Why, not much, Father Cowley said. I'm barricaded up, Simon, with two men prowling around the house trying to effect an entrance. 
Jolly, Mr. Dedalus said. Who is it? Oh, Father Cowley said, a certain gombean man of our acquaintance. With a broken back, is it? Mr. Dedalus asked. The same, Simon, Father Crowley answered. Reuben of that ilk, I'm just waiting for Ben Dollard. He's going to say a word to Long John to get him to take those two men off. All I want is a little time. He looked with vague hope up and down the quay, a big apple bulging in his neck. I know, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding. Poor old Badaki Ben. He's always go doing a good turn for someone. Hold hard. He put on his glasses and gazed towards the metal bridge an instant. There he is, by God, he said, arse and pockets. Ben Dollard's loose blue cutaway and square hat above large slops crossed the quay in full gait from the metal bridge. He came towards them at an amble, scratchingly act scratching actively behind his coat-tails. As he came near, metal Mr. Dedalus greeted. Hold that fellow with the bowed, bad trousers. Hold him now, Ben Dollard said. Mr. Dedalus eyed with cold, wandering scorn various points of Ben Dollard's figure. Then, turning to Father Cowley with a nod, he muttered sneeringly, That's a petty garment, isn't it, for a summer's day? Why, God eternally curse your soul, Ben Do Dollard growled furiously. I threw out more clothes in my time than you ever saw. He stood beside them, beaming on them first on his roomy clothes, from points of which Mr. Dedalus flicked fluff, saying, They were made for a man of his health. Ben, anyhow. Bad luck to the Jew man that made them, Ben Dollard said. Thanks be to God, he's not paid yet. And how is that Basso Profundo, Benjamin, Father Cowley asked. Cashel, Boyle, O'Connor, Fitmaurice, Tisdall, Farrell, murmuring, glassy-eyed, strode past the Kildare Street Club. Ben Dollard frowned and, making suddenly a chanter's mouth, gave forth a deep, deep note. Ah, he said. That's the style, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding it to its drone. What about that, Ben Dollard said, not too dusty, what? He turned to both. That'll do, Father Cowley said, nodding also. The Reverend Hugh C. Love walked from Old Chapter House of St. Mary's, Abbey Past Jane, and Charles Kennedy's rectifiers, attended by Geraldine's tall and personable, towards Falsell beyond the ford of hurdles. Ben Dollard, with, heavy, with a heavy list towards the shop fronts, led him forward his joyful fingers in the air. Come along with me to sub-sheriff's office, he said. I want to show you the new beauty Rock has for bailiff. He's a cross between Laban Gula and Lynchehan. He's well worth seeing, mind you. Come along. I saw John Henry Menton casually in the bodega just now, and it will cost me a fall if I don't wait a while. We're on the right lay, Bob, believe you me. For a few days, tell him, Father Cowley said anxiously. Ben Dollard halted and stared, his loud orifice open, a dangling button off his coat wagging bright back from its thread as he wiped away the heavy shrums that clogged his eyes to hear aright. What few days, he boomed. Hasn't your landlord distrained for rent? He has, Father Cowley said. Then our friend's writ is not worth the paper it's printed on, Ben Dollard said. The landlord has the prior claim. I gave him all the particulars. 29 Windsor Avenue. Love, the, love is the name? That's right, Father Cowley said. The Reverend Mr. Love. He's a minister in the country somewhere. But are you sure of that? You can tell Barbarus from me, Ben Dollard said, that he can put that writ where Jacko put the nuts. He let Father Cowley boldly forward, linked to his bulk. Filberts, I believe they were, Mr. Dedalus said, as he dropped his glasses on his coat front, following them. The youngster will be all right, Martin Cunningham said, as they passed out of the castle yard gate. The policeman touched his forehead. God bless you, Martin Cunningham said cheerfully. He signed to the waiting Jarvie, who chucked at the reins and set on towards Lord Edward Street. Bronze by gold, Miss Kennedy's head by Miss Deuce's head, appeared above the cross-blind of the Ormond Hotel. "'Yes,' Martin Cunningham said, fingering his beard. 
I wrote to Father Conmee and laid the whole case before him. "'You could try our friend,' Mr. Power suggested backward. "'Boyd?' Martin Cunningham said shortly. "'Touch me not.' John Wise Nolan, lagging behind, reading the list, came after them quickly down Cork Hill. On the steps of the city hall, Councillor Nanetti, descending, hailed Alderman Cowley and Councillor Abraham Lyon, ascending. The castle car wheeled empty into Upper Exchange Street. "'Look here, Martin,' John Wise Nolan said, overtaking them at the mail office. "'I see Bloom put his name down for five shillings.' "'Quite right.' Martin Cunningham said, taking the list, and put down the five shillings, too. "'Without a second word, either,' Mr. Power said. "'Strange but true,' Martin Cunningham added. John Wise Nolan opened wide eyes. "'I'll say there is much kindness in the Jew,' he quoted elegantly. They went down Parliament Street. "'There's Jimmy Henry,' Mr. Power said, just heading for Kavanaugh's. Right o, Martin Cunningham said. Here goes. Outside La Maison Claire, Blazes Boylan waylaid Jack Mooney's brother in law, humpy, tight, making for the liberties. John Wise Nolan fell back with Mr. Power, while Martin Cunningham took the elbow of the dapper little man in a shower of hail suit, who walked uncertainly with hasty steps past Mickey Anderson's watches. The assistant town clerk's corns are giving him some trouble. John Wise Nolan told Mr. Power. They followed round the corner towards James Cavanaugh's wine-rooms. The empty castle car fronted them at rest in Essex Gate. Martin Cunningham, speaking always, showed often the list at which Jimmy Henry did not glance. "'And Long John Fanning is here, too,' John Wise Nolan said, as large as life. The tall form of Long John Fanning filled the doorway where he stood. "'Good day, Mr. Subsheriff,' Martin Cunningham said, as all halted and greeted. Long John Fanning made no way for them. He removed his large Henry Clay decisively, and his large fierce eyes scowled intelligently over all their faces. "'Are the conscript fathers pursuing their peaceful deliberations?' he said, with rich, acrid utterance to the assistant town clerk. "'Hell open to Christians they were having,' Jimmy Henry said pettishly, about their damned Irish language. Where was the marshal, he wanted to know, to keep order in the council chamber? And old Barlow, the mace-bearer, laid up with asthma, no mace on the table, nothing in order, no quorum even, and Hutchinson, the Lord Mayor, in Londono, and little Lorcan Sherlock doing locum tenens for him. Damned Irish language, language of our forefathers.' Long John Fanning blew a plume of smoke from his lips. Martin Cunningham spoke by turns, twirling the peak of his beard to the assistant town clerk and the sub-sheriff, while John Wise Nolan held his peace. "'What dignum was that?' Long John Fanning asked. Jimmy Henry made a grimace and lifted his left foot. "'Oh, my corns!' he said plaintively. "'Come upstairs, for goodness' sake, till I sit down somewhere. Oof! Ooh!' Mind! Testily he made room for himself beside Long John Fanning's flank, and passed in and up the stairs. "'Come on up,' Martin Cunningham said to the sub-sheriff. "'I don't think you knew him, or perhaps you did, though.' With John Wise Nolan, Mr. Power followed them in. "'Decent little soul he was,' Mr. Power said to the stalwart back of Long John Fanning, ascending towards Long John Fanning in the mirror." "'Rather low-sized, dignum of Menton's office that was,' Martin Cunningham said. Long John Fanning could not remember him. A clatter of horse-hoofs sounded from the air. "'What's that?' Martin Cunningham said. All turned where they stood. John Wise Nolan came down again. From the cool shadows of the doorway he saw the horses pass Parliament Street, harness and glossy pasterns in sunlight shimmering. Gaily they went past before his cool, unfriendly eyes, not quickly. In saddles of the leaders, leaping leaders, rode outriders. "'What was it?' Martin Cunningham asked, as they went on up the staircase. "'The Lord Lieutenant General and General Governor of Ireland,' John Wise Nolan answered from the stairfoot. 
As they trod across the thick carpet, Buck Mulligan whispered behind his Panama to Haynes, Parnell's brother, there in the corner. They chose a small table near the window opposite a long-faced man whose beard and gaze hung intently down on a chessboard. "'Is that he?' Haynes asked, twisting round in his seat. "'Yes,' Mulligan said. "'That's John Howard, his brother, our city marshal.' John Howard Parnell translated a white bishop quietly, and his grey claw went up again to his forehead, whereat it rested. An instant after, under its screen, his eyes looked quickly, ghost-bright, at his foe, and fell once more upon a working corner. "'I'll take a melange,' Haynes said to the waitress. Two melanges, Buck Mulligan said, and bring us some scones and butter and some cakes as well. When she had gone, he said, laughing, We call it DBC, because they have damn bad cakes. Oh, but you missed Daedalus on Hamlet. Haynes opened his new-bought book. I'm sorry, he said. Shakespeare is the happy hunting ground of all minds that have lost their balance. The one-legged sailor growled at the area of 14 Nelson Street. "'England expects!' Buck Mulligan's primrose waistcoat shook gaily to his laughter. "'You should see him,' he said, "'when his body loses its balance. Wandering Angus, I call him.' "'I am sure he has an idée fixe,' Haynes said, pinching his chin thoughtfully with thumb and forefinger. "'How I am speculating what it would be likely to be, such persons always have. Buck Mulligan bent across the table gravely. They drove his wits astray, he said, by visions of hell. He will never capture the attic note, the note of Swinburne, of all poets, the white death and the ruddy birth. That is his tragedy. He can never be a poet, the joy of creation. Eternal punishment, Haynes said, nodding curtly. I see. I tackled him this morning on belief. There was something on his mind, I saw. It's rather interesting, because Professor Pokorny of Vienna makes an interesting point out of that. Buck Mulligan's watchful eyes saw the waitress come. He helped her to unload her tray. "'He can find no trace of hell in ancient Irish myth,' Haynes said, amid the cheerful cups. "'The moral idea seems lacking, the sense of destiny, of retribution.' Rather strange he should have just that fixed idea. Does he write anything for your movement? He sank two lumps of sugar deftly longwise through the whipped cream. Buck Mulligan slit a steaming scone in two and plastered butter over its smoking pith. He bit off a soft piece hungrily. Ten years, he said, chewing and laughing. He is going to write something in ten years. Seems a long way off, Haynes said thoughtfully lifting his spoon. Still, I shouldn't wonder if he did after all. He tasted a spoonful from the creamy cone of his cup. This is real Irish cream, I take it, he said with forbearance. I don't want to be imposed on. Elijah, skiff, light, crumpled throwaway, sailed eastward by flanks of ships and trawlers, amid an archipelago of corks, beyond New Wapping Street, past Benson's Ferry, and by the three-masted schooner Rosevian from Bridgewater with the bricks. Almidano Artifoni walked past Hollis Street, past Sewell's Yard. Behind him Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell, with stick umbrella a just coat dangling, shunned the lamp before Mr. Law Smith's house and, crossing, walked along Marion Square. Distantly behind him a blind stripling tapped his way by the wall of College Park. Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell walked as far as Mr. Lewis Werner's cheerful windows, then turned and strode back along Marion Square, his stick-umbrella adjust coat dangling. At the corner of Wilde's he halted, frowned at Elijah's name announced on the Metropolitan Hall, frowned at the distant pleasance of Duke's lawn. His eyeglasses flashed, frowning in the sun. With rat's teeth bared, he muttered, Coactus volui. He strode on for Clare Street, grinding his fierce word. 
As he strode past Mr. Bloom's dental windows, the sway of his dust-coat brushed rudely from its angle a slender tapping cane, and swept onwards, having buffeted a thewless body. The blind stripling turned his sickly face after the striding form. "'God's curse on you!' he said sourly. "'Whoever you are, you're blinder nor I am, you bitches bastard!' Opposite Ruggy O'Donoghue's Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam, pawing, uh, pawing the pound and a half of mangans, late Fahrenbach's pork steaks he had been sent for, went along warm Wicklow Street, dawdling. It was too blooming dull sitting in the parlour with Mrs. Stower and Mrs. Quigley and Mrs. MacDowell and the blind down, and they all at their sniffles and sipping sups of the superior tawny sherry Uncle Barney brought from Tunney's and they eating crumbs of the cottage fruit-cake, jawing the whole blooming time, and sighing. After Wicklow Lane, the window of Madame Doyle, court-dress milliner, stopped him. He stood looking in at the two puckers, stripped to their pelts and putting up their props. From the side-mirrors, two mourning masters, Dignam gaped silently. Myler Keogh, Dublin's pet lamb, will meet Sergeant Major Bennett, the Portobello Bruiser, for a purse of fifty sovereigns. Gob, that'd be a good pucking match to see. Myler Keogh, that's the chap sparring out to him with the green sash. Two-bar entrance, soldiers half price. I could easy do a bunk on Ma. Master Dignam on his left turned as he turned. That's me in mourning. When is it? May the twenty-second. Sure, the blooming thing is all over. He turned to the right, and on his right Master Dignam turned, his cap awry, his collar sticking up. Buttoning it down, his chin lifted, he saw the image of Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, beside the two puckers. One of them mots that do be in the packets of fag stores smokes, that his old fellow welted hell out of him for one time he found out. Master Dignam got his collar down and dawdled on. The best pucker going for strength was Fitzsimmons. One puck in the wind from that fellow would knock you into the middle of next week, man. But the best pucker for science was Jem Corbett before Fitzsimmons knocked the stuffings out of him, dodging and all. In Grafton Street, Master Dignam saw a red flower in a toff's mouth, and a swell pair of kicks on him, and he listening to what the drunk was telling him and grinning all the time. No Sandy Mount tram. Master Dignam walked along Nassau Street, shifted the pork steaks to his other hand. His collar sprang up again, and he tugged it down. The blooming stud was too small for the buttonhole of the shirt, blooming end to it. He met schoolboys with satchels. I'm not going tomorrow either. Stay away till Monday. He met other schoolboys. Do they notice I'm in mourning? Uncle Barney said he'd get it into the paper tonight. Then they'll all see it in the paper and read my name printed, and Pa's name. His face got all grey, instead of being red like it was, and there was a fly walking over it up to his eye. The scrunch that was when they were screwing the screws into the coffin, and the bumps when they were bringing it downstairs. Pa was inside it, and Ma crying in the parlour, and Uncle Barney telling the men how to get it round the bend. A big coffin it was, and high and heavy-looking. How was that? The last night Pa was boozed, he was standing on the landing there, bawling out for his boots to go out to Tunney's, for to booze more, and he looked buddy and short in his shirt. Never see him again. Death, that is. Pa is dead. My father is dead. He told me to be a good son to Ma. I couldn't hear the other things he said, but I saw his tongue and his teeth trying to say it better. Poor Pa. That was Mr. Dignam, my father. I hope he is in purgatory now, because he went to confession to Father Conroy on Saturday night. William Humble, Earl of Dudley, and Lady Dudley, accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Heseltine, drove out after luncheon from the Viceregal Lodge. In the following carriage were the Honourable Mrs. Paget, Miss de Courcy, and the Honourable Gerald Ward A.D.C. in attendance. The cavalcade passed out by the lower gate of Phoenix Park, saluted by obsequious policemen, and proceeded past Kingsbridge along the northern quays. The viceroy was most cordially greeted on his way through the metropolis. 
At Bloody Bridge Mr. Thomas Kernan, beyond the river, greeted him vainly from afar. Between Queen's and Whitworth Bridges, Lord Dudley's viceregal carriages passed, and were unsaluted by Mr. Dudley White, B.L., M.A., who stood on Aaron K. outside Mrs. M. E. White's, the pawnbroker's, at the corner of Aaron Street West, stroking his nose with his forefinger, undecided whether he should arrive at Fibsborough more quickly by a triple change of tram, or by hailing a car, or on foot through Smithfield, Constitution Hill, and Broadstone Terminus. In the porch of four courts, with Richie Goulding, with the coat's bag of Goulding, Collis, and Ward, saw him with surprise. Past Richmond Bridge, at the doorstep of the office, of Reuben J. Dodd, solicitor, agent for the Patriotic Insurance Company, an elderly female about to enter changed her plan, and, retracing her steps by King's windows, smiled credulously, credulously, on the representative of His Majesty. From its sluice in Wood K. Wall, under Tom Devon's office, Poddle River hung out in fealty a tongue of liquid sewage. Above the cross-blind of the Ormond Hotel, gold by bronze, Miss Kennedy's head by Miss Deuce's head watched and admired. On Ormond K. Mr. Simon Dedalus, steering his way from the greenhouse for the sub-sheriff's office, stood still in mid-street, and brought his hat low. His Excellency, grace, his Excellency graciously returned Mr. Dedalus's greeting. From Cahill's corner the Reverend Hugh C. Love, M.A., made obeisance unperceived, mindful of Lord's deputies whose hands, benignant, had held of your rich advowsons. On Grattan Bridge Lenehan and McCoy, taking leave of each other, watched the carriages go by. Passing by Roger Green's office and Dollard's big red printing house, Gertie McDowell, carrying the Catesby Cork lino letters for her father, who was laid up, knew by the style it was the Lord and Lady Lieutenant, but she couldn't see what Her Excellency had on, because the tram and Spring's big yellow furniture van had to stop in front of her on account of its being the Lord Lieutenant. Beyond Lundy's Beyond Lundy Foots, from the shaded door of Kavanaugh's wine-rooms, John Wise Nolan smiled with unseen coldness towards the Lord Lieutenant-General and General Governor of Ireland. The Right Honourable William Humble, Earl of Dudley, G.C.V.O., passed Mickey Anderson's all-times ticking watches, and Henry and James's wax smart-suited fresh-cheeked models, the gentleman Henry, Dernier Cree James. Over against Dame Gate, Tom Roachford <clears throat> and Nosy Flynn watched the approach of the cavalcade. Tom Roachford, seeing the eyes of Lady Dudley fixed on him, took his thumbs quickly out of the pockets of his claret waistcoat and doffed his cap to her. A charming soubrette, great Marie Kendall with dauby cheeks and lifted skirt, smiled daubily from her poster upon William Humble. Earl of Dudley, and upon Lieutenant Colonel H. G. Hesseltine, and also upon the Honourable Gerald Ward, A.D.C. From the window of the D.B.C., Buck Mulligan gaily and Haynes gravely gazed down on the viceregal equipage over the shoulders of eager guests, whose mass of forms darkened the chessboard whereon John Howard Parnell looked intently. In Fauna Street, Dilly Dedalus, straining her sight upward from Chardinal, Chardinal's first French primer, primer, saw sunshades spanned and wheel-spokes spinning in the glare. John Henry Menton, filling the doorway of commercial buildings, stared from wine-big oyster eyes, holding a fat gold hunter watch not looked at in his fat left hand not feeling it. Where the foreleg of King Billy's horse pawed the air, Mrs. Breen plucked her hastening husband back from under the hoofs of the outriders. She shouted in his ear the tidings. Understanding, he shifted his tomes to his left breast and saluted the second carriage. The Honourable Gerald Ward, A.D.C., agreeably surprised, made haste to reply. At Ponsonby's corner a jaded white flagon, H., halted, and four tall-hatted white flagons halted behind him, E-L-Y-S, 
while outriders pranced past and carriages. Opposite Pigott's music ware rooms, Mr. Gen Dennis J. Magini, professor of dancing, etc., gaily apparelled, gravely walked, out passed by a viceroy, and unobserved. By the provost's wall came jauntily Blazes Boylan, stepping in tanned shoes and socks with sky-blue clocks, to the refrain of, My girl's a Yorkshire girl. Blazes Boylan presented to the leaders sky-blue frontlets and high action a sky-blue tie, a wide-brimmed straw hat at a rakish angle, and a suit of indigo serge. His hands in his jacket pockets forgot to salute, but he offered to the three ladies the bold admiration of his eyes, and the red flower between his lips. As they drove along Nassau Street, His Excellency drew the attention of his bowling consort to the programme of music which was being discoursed in College Park. Unseen brazen highland laddies blared and drum-thumped after the cortege. But though she's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes, barabum, yet I've a sort of a Yorkshire relish for my little Yorkshire rose, barabum. Thither of the wall the quarter-mile flat handicappers, M. C. Green, H. Thrift, T. M. Patty, C. Scaife, J. B. Jeffs, G. N. Morphy, F. Stevenson, C. Adderley, and W. C. Huggard started in pursuit. Striding past Finn's Hotel, Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell stared through a fierce eyeglass across the carriages at the head of Mr. M. E. Solomons in the window of the Austro-Hungarian Vice-Consulate. Deep in Leinster Street, by Trinity's postern, a loyal kingsman, hornblower, touched his tally-ho cap. As the glossy horses pranced by Marion Square, Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam, waiting, saw salutes being given to the gent with the topper, and raised also his new black cap, with fingers greased by pork-steak paper. His collar, too, sprang up. The viceroy, on his way to inaugurate the Myrus Bazaar in aid of funds for Mercer's Hospital, drove with his following towards Lower Mount Street. He passed a blind stripling opposite Broadbent's. In Lower Mount Street a pedestrian, in a brown mackintosh, eating dry bread, passed swiftly and unscathed across the viceroy's path. At the Royal Canal Bridge, from his hoarding, Mr. Eugene Stratton, his blub lips a grin, bade all comers welcome to Pembroke Township. At Haddington Road Corner two sanded women halted themselves, an umbrella and a bag in which eleven cockles rolled to view with wonder the Lord Mayor and Lady Mayoress without his golden chain. On Northumberland and Lansdowne roads His Excellency acknowledged punctually salutes from rare male walkers. The salute of two small schoolboys at the garden gate of the house, said to have been admired by the late Queen when visiting the Irish capital with her husband, the Prince Consort, in 1849 and the salute of Almidano Artifoni's sturdy trousers, swallowed by a closing door. End of chapter 10 Read by Hugh and Kara and Mike on August 21st, 2006, and 22nd, 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 11a. Bronze by gold heard the hoof irons, steely ringing imperthinanan. Chips, picking chips off rocky thumbnail, chips. Horrid, and gold flushed more. A husky fife note blew. Blue. Blue bloom is on the gold pinnacled hair. A jumping rose on satiny breast of satin, rose of Castile. Trilling, trilling, I Dolores. Peep, 
"'Who's in the peep of gold?' Tink cried to bronze in pity. "'And a call, pure, long and throbbing, long in dying call. "'Decoy, soft word, but look, the bright stars fade. "'Notes chirruping answer. "'O oh, rose, Castile, the morn is breaking. "'Jingle, jingle, jaunted, jingling. "'Coin rang, clock clacked. "'A vowel, sonnet. "'I could, rebound of garter, not leave thee. "'Smack, la cloche, thigh smack. "'A vowel, warm, sweetheart, good-bye. "'Jingle, blue. Boomed crashing chords, when love absorbs. War, war, the tympanum. A sail, a veil, a wave upon the waves. Lost, throstle fluted, all is lost now. Horn, hawthorn. When first he saw, alas, full tup, full trob, full throb, warbling. Ah, lure, alluring. Martha, come. Clap, clap, clip, clap, clappy, clap. Good God, he never heard in all. Deaf bald pat brought pad knife took up. A moonlit night call. Far, far. I feel so sad. P.S. So lonely blooming. Listen. The spiked and winding cold sea horn. Have you the? Each, and for other, plash and silent roar. Pearls, when she lists rhapsodies, hiss. You don't? Did not, no, no, believe, liddy lid, with a cock and a... With a cock with a cara. Black, deep-sounding, do, Ben, do. Wait while you wait. Hee hee, wait while you hee, but wait. Low in dark middle earth, embedded o'er. Now mind a mine, preacher is he, all gone, all fallen. Tiny her tremulous fern foils of maiden hair. Armin, he gnashed in fury, fro, to, fro, a baton cool protruding. Bronze Lydia by Minigold. By bronze, by gold, in ocean green of shadow. Bloom, old bloom. One rapped, one tapped, with a cara, with a cock. Pray for him, pray, good people. His gouty fingers knackering. Big Benaben, Big Benben. Last rose, Castile of summer, left bloom, I feel so sad alone. Pwee, little wind piped, wee. True men, lid care, cow, dee, and doll. Ay, ay, like you men, will lift your chink with chunk. Pff, ooh, where bronze from anear, where gold from afar, where hoofs? Rup, cra, crandle. Then, not till then, my epriptaph, be frit. Done. Begin. Bronze by gold. Miss Deuce's head by Miss Kennedy's head, over the cross-blind of the Ormond bar, heard the viceregal hoofs go by, ringing steel. "'Is that her?' asked Miss Kennedy. Miss Deuce said yes, sitting with his ex, Pearl Grey and Eau de Nil. "'Exquisite contrast,' Miss Kennedy said. When all agog, Miss Deuce said eagerly, "'Look at the fellow in the tall silk!' "'Who, where?' Gold asked more eagerly. In the second carriage, Miss Deuce's wet lips said, laughing in the sun. He's looking, mind till I see. She darted bronze to the backmost corner, flattening her face against the pane in a halo of hurried breath. Her wet lips tittered. He's killed looking back. She laughed. Oh, wept, aren't men frightful idiots? With sadness. Miss Kennedy sauntered sadly from bright light, twining a loose hair behind an ear. Sauntering sadly, gold no more, she twisted, twined a hair. 
Sadly she twined in sauntering gold hair behind a curving ear. "'It's them has the fine times,' sadly then she said. A man. Blue who went by by Mulang's pipes, bearing in his breast the sweets of sin, by wines antiques, in memory bearing sweet sinful words, by Carol's dusky battered plate, for Raoul. The boots to them, them in the bar, them barmaids came. For them unheeding him he banged on the counter his tray of chattering china, and— "'There's your teas,' he said. Miss Kennedy, with manners, transposed the tea-tray down to an upturned lithia crate, safe from eyes, low. "'What is it?' loud boots unmannerly asked. "'Find out,' Miss Deuce reported, retorted, leaving her spying-point. "'Your bow, is it?' A haughty bronze replied. "'I'll complain to Mrs. de Massey on you if I hear any more of your impertinent insolence.' Impersa thin 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 Boots' snout sniffed rudely, as he retreated as she threatened as he had come. Bloom. On her flower frowning, Miss Deuce said, "'Most aggravating that young brat is. If he doesn't conduct himself, I'll wring his ear for him a yard long.' Ladylike, in exquisite contrast. "'Take no notice,' Miss Kennedy rejoined. She poured in a teacup tea, then back in the teapot tea. They cowered under their reef of counter, waiting on footstools, crates upturned, waiting for their teas to draw. They pawed their blouses, both of black satin, two and nine a yard, waiting for their teas to draw, and two and seven. Yes, bronze from anear, buy gold from afar, heard steel from anear, hoofs ring from afar, and heard steel hoofs ring hoof ring steel. "'Am I awfully sunburnt?' Miss Bronze unbloused her neck. "'No,' said Miss Kennedy. "'It gets brown after. Did you try the borax with the cherry laurel water?' Miss Deuce half stood to see her skin askance in the bar mirror, gilded lettered where hock and claret glasses shimmered, and in their midst a shell. "'And leave it to my hands,' she said. "'Try it with the glycerin,' Miss Kennedy advised. Bidding her neck and hands adieu, Miss Deuce. Those things only bring out a rash, replied, reseated. I asked that old fogey in Boyd's for something for my skin. Miss Kennedy, pouring now a full-drawn tea, grimaced and prayed, Oh, don't remind me of him, for mercy's sake. But wait till I tell you, Miss Deuce entreated. Sweet tea, Miss Kennedy, having poured with milk, plugged both two ears with little fingers. "'No, don't!' she cried. "'I won't listen!' she cried. "'But Bloom?' "'Miss Deuce grunted in snuffy Fogey's tone. "'For your what?' says he. "'Miss Kennedy unplugged her ears to hear, to speak, but said, but prayed again. "'Don't let me think of him, or I'll expire, the hideous old wretch, "'that night in the antient concert-rooms.' She sipped distastefully her brew, hot tea, a sip, sipped sweet tea. "'Here he was,' Miss Deuce said, cocking her bronze head three-quarters, ruffling her nose-wings. "'Huffa, huffa!' Shrill shriek of laughter sprang from Miss Kennedy's throat. Miss Deuce huffed and snorted down her nostrils that quivered imperthen like a snout in quest. "'Oh!' shrieking, Miss Kennedy cried. "'Will you ever forget his goggle eye?' Miss Deuce chimed in, in deep bronze laughter, shouting, "'And your other eye!' "'Blow whose dark eye read Aaron Figatner's name. Why do I always think Figather? Gathering figs, I think, and Prosper Lore's Huguenot name. By bassy blessed virgins Bloom's dark eyes went by. Blue-robed, white under, come to me. God they believe she is, or goddess. Those to-day, I could not see.' That fellow spoke, a student, after with Daedalus's son. He might be Mulligan. All comely virgins. That brings those rakes of fellows in, her white. By went his eyes, the sweets of sin, sweet are the sweets of sin. In a giggling peal young gold bronze voices blended, deuce with Kennedy your other eye. They threw young heads back, 
bronze giggle gold, to let free fly their laughter, screaming, your other, signals to each other, high piercing notes. Ah, panting, sighing, sighing, ah, fordone, their mirth died down. Miss Kennedy lipped her cup again, raised, drank a sip, and giggle giggled. Miss Deuce, bending over the tea-tray, ruffled again her nose and rolled droll, fattened eyes. Again Kenny giggles, stooping, her fair pinnacles of hair, stooping, her tortoise nape-comb showed, spluttered out of her mouth her tea, choking in tea and laughter, coughing with choking, crying, "'Oh, greasy eyes! Imagine being married to a man like that!' she cried. "'With his bit of beard!' Deuce gave full vent to a splendid yell, a full yell of full woman, delight, joy, indignation. "'Married to the greasy nose!' she yelled. Shrill with deep laughter, after gold after bronze, they urged each other to peal after peal, ringing in changes, bronze gold, gold bronze, shrill deep, to laughter after laughter, and then laughed more. Greasy I knows, exhausted, breathless, their shaken heads they laid, braided and pinnacled by glossy combed, against the counter ledge, all flushed, oh, panting, sweating, oh, all breathless, married to bloom, to grease a bloom, oh, saints above, Miss Deuce said, sighed above her jumping rose, I wished I hadn't laughed so much, I feel all wet, oh, Miss Deuce. Miss Kennedy protested, "'You horrid thing!' And flushed yet more, "'You horrid, more goldenly!' By Cantwell's offices roved Greasabloom, by Seppi's virgins, bright of their oils. Nanetti's father hawked those things about, wheedling at doors as I. Religion pays. Must see him for that par. Eat first. I want. Not yet. At four, she said, time ever passing. Clock hands turning. On. Where eat the Clarence Dolphin? Dolphin. On. For Raoul, eat. If I net five guineas with those ads. The violet silk petticoats. Not yet. The sweets of sin. Flushed less, still less, goldenly paled. Into their bar strolled Mr. Dedalus, chips, picking chips off one of his rocky thumbnails. Chips! He strolled. Oh, welcome back, Miss Deuce. He held her hand. Enjoyed her holidays? Tip-top! He hoped she had nice weather in Rustrevor. Gorgeous, she said. Look at the holy show I am, lying out on the strand all day. Bronze whiteness. That was exceedingly naughty of you, Mr. Dedalus told her, and pressed her hand indulgently. Tempting poor simple males. Miss Deuce of Satin deuced her arm away. Oh, go away, she said. You're very simple, I don't think. He was. Well, now I am, he mused. I looked so simple in the cradle they christened me Simple Simon. You must have been doughty. Miss Deuce made answer, and what did the doctor order to-day? Well, now, he mused, whatever you say yourself, I think I'll trouble you for some fresh water and a half-glass of whiskey. Jingle. With the greatest alacrity, Miss Deuce agreed. With grace of alacrity, towards the mirror-gilt Cantrell and Cochrane's, she turned herself. With grace, she tapped a measure of gold whiskey from her crystal keg. Forth from the skirt of his coat Mr. Dedalus brought pouch and pipe. Alacrity she served. He blew through the flue two husky fife notes. By Jove, he mused, I often wanted to see the Morn Mountains. Must be a great tonic in the air down there. But a long threatening comes at last, they say. Yes, yes. Yes. He fingered shreds of hair, her maiden hair, her mermaids, into the bowl. Chips. Shreds, musing, mute. None naught said nothing, yes. Gaily Miss Deuce polished a tumbler, trilling, O oh, I, Dolores, queen of the eastern seas! Was Mr. Lidwell in to-day? 
In came Lenehan. Round him peered Lenehan. Mr. Bloom reached Essex Bridge. Yes, Mr. Bloom crossed Bridge of Essex. To Martha I must write. By paper. Dallies. Girl, they're civil. Bloom. Old Bloom. Blue Bloom is on the rye. He was in at lunchtime, Miss Deuce said. Lenehan came forward. Was Mr. Boylan looking for me? he asked. She answered. "'Miss Kennedy, was Mr. Boylan in while I was upstairs?' she asked. Miss Voice of Kennedy answered, a second teacup poised, her gaze upon a page. "'No, he was not.' Miss Gaze of Kennedy, heard, not seen, read on. Lenehan, round the sandwich bell, wound his round body round. "'Peep! Who's in the corner?' No glance of Kennedy rewarding him yet he made overtures, to mind her stops to read only the black ones, round O and crooked S. Jingle jaunty jingle. Girl gold she read and did not glance, take no notice. She took no notice while he read by rote a sulfa fable for her, plappering flatly. Ah, fox met a ah, stork, said the fox to the stork, will you put your bill down in my throat and pull up a bone? He droned in vain. Miss Deuce turned to her tea aside. He sighed aside. Ah, me! Oh, my! He greeted Mr. Dedalus, and got a nod. Greetings from the famous son of a famous father. Who may he be? Mr. Dedalus asked. Lenehan opened most genial arms. Who? Who may he be? he asked. Can you ask? Stephen, the youthful bard. Dry. Mr. Dedalus, famous father, laid by his dry-filled pipe. I see, he said. I didn't recognize him for the moment. I hear he is keeping very select company. Have you seen him lately? He had. I quaffed the nectar bowl with him this very day, said Lenehan, in Mooney's en ville, and in Mooney's sur mer. He had received the rhino for the labor of his muse. He smiled at bronze's tea-bathed lips, at listening lips and eyes. The elite of Erin hung upon his lips, the ponderous pundit, Hugh McHugh, Dublin's most brilliant scribe and editor, and that minstrel boy of the wild wet west, who is known by the euphonious appellation of the O'Madden Burke. After an interval Mr. Dedalus raised his grog, and, "'That must have been highly diverting,' said he. "'I see.' He see. He drank. With far away morning mountain eye, set down his glass. He looked towards the saloon door. I see you moved the piano. The tuner was in today, Miss Deuce replied, tuning it for the smoking concert, and I never heard such an exquisite player. Is that a fact? Didn't he, Miss Kennedy, the real classical, you know, and blind, too, poor fellow? Not twenty, I'm sure he was. Is that a fact? Mr. Dedalus said. He drank and strayed away. So sad to look at his face, Miss Deuce condoled. God's curse on bitches bastard. Tink to her pity cried a dinner's bell. A diner's bell. To the door of the bar and dining room came bald Pat, came bothered Pat, came Pat, waiter of Ormond, lager for dinner, lager without alacrity she served. With patience Lenehan waited for Boylan with impatience, for Jingle Jaunty Blazes boy. Upholding the lid, he, who, gazed in the coffin, coffin, at the oblique triple, piano, wires. He pressed, the same who pressed indulgently her hand, soft pedaling, a triple of keys to see the thicknesses of felt advancing, to hear the muffled hammer fall in action. Two sheets, cream, vellum, paper, one reserve, two envelopes, when I was in wisdom, Helly's wise bloom in dailies, Henry Flower bought. Are you not happy in your home? Flower to console me, and a pin cuts low. Means something, language of flow. Was it a daisy? Innocence, that is. Respectable girl, meet after mass. Thanks awfully muchly. Wise Bloom eyed on the door a poster, a swaying mermaid smoking mid-nice waves. Smoke mermaids, 
coolest whiff of all. Hair streaming, lovelorn, for some man, for Raoul. He eyed and saw afar on Essex Bridge a gay hat riding on a jaunting car. It is, again, third time, coincidence. Jingling on supple rubbers it jaunted from the bridge to Ormond Quay. Follow, risk it, go quick, at four, near now, out. Tuppence, sir, the shop-girl dared to say. Ah, I was forgetting, excuse. And four. At four she, winslemly she, on blue him whom smiled. Blue smy qui go, turn noon. Think you're the only pebble on the beach? Does that to all. For men. In drowsy silence gold bent on her page. From the saloon a call came, long and dying. That was a tuning fork the tuner had that he forgot that he now struck. A call again. That he now poised, that it now throbbed, you hear? It throbbed, pure, purer, softly and softlier, its buzzing prongs. Longer in dying call. Pat paid for diner's pop-corked bottle, and over tumbler tray and pop-corked bottle, ere he went he whispered, bald and bothered, without. With Miss Deuce. The bright stars fade. A voiceless song sang from within, singing. The morn is breaking. A duodene of bird notes chirruped bright treble answer under sensitive hands. Brightly the keys, all twinkling, linked, all harps according, called to a voice to sing the strain of dewy morn, of youth, of love's leave-taking, life's, love's morn. The dewdrops pearl. Lenehan's lips over the counter lisped a low whistle of decoy. But look this way, he said, Rose of Castile. Jingle jaunted by the curb and stopped. She rose and closed her reading, Rose of Castile, fretted, forlorn, dreamily rose. Did she fall, or was she pushed? he asked her. She answered, slighting. Ask no questions, and you'll hear no lies. Like lady, ladylike. Blazes Boylan's smart tan shoes creaked on the bar floor where he strode. Yes, gold from a near by bronze from afar. Lenahan heard and knew and hailed him. See, the conquering hero comes. Between the car and window, warily walking, went Bloom, unconquered hero. See me he might, the seat he sat on, warm. Black wary he-cat walked towards Richie Golding's legal bag, lifted aloft, saluting. And I from thee. I heard you were round, said Blazes Boylan. He touched to fair Miss Kennedy a rim of his slanted straw. She smiled on him, but Sister Bronze outsmiled her, preening for him her richer hair, a bosom and a rose. Smart Boylan bespoke potions. What's your cry, glass of bitter? Glass of bitter, please, and a slow gin for me. Wire in yet? Not yet. At four she. Who said four? Cowley's red lugs and bulging apple in the door of the sheriff's office. Avoid. Goulding a chance. What is he doing in the Ormond? Car waiting. Wait. Hello. Where off to? Something to eat? I too was just. In here. What, Ormond? Best value in Dublin. Is that so? Dining room. Sit tight there. See, not be seen. I think I'll join you. Come on. Richie led on. Bloom followed bag. Dinner fit for a prince. Miss Deuce reached high to take a flagon, stretching her satin arm, her bust, that all but burst so high. Oh, oh, jerked Lenahan, gasping at each stretch, oh! But easily she seized her prey and let it low in triumph. Why don't you grow? asked Blazes Boylan. She bronze, dealing from her oblique jar thick syrupy liquor for his lips, looked as it flowed. Flower in his coat, who gave him? And syrupped with her voice. Fine goods in small parcels. That is to say, she. Neatly she poured slow syrupy slow. Here's fortune, Blazes said. He pitched a broad coin down. Coin rang. Hold on, said Lenahan, till I— 
Fortune, he wished, lifting his bubbled ale. Scepter will win in a canter, he said. I plunged a bit, said Boylan, winking and drinking. Not on my own, you know. Fancy of a friend of mine. Lenehan still drank and grinned at his tilted ale and at Miss Deuce's lips that all but hummed, not shut, the ocean song her lips had trilled. Idolores, the eastern seas. Clock whirred. Miss Kennedy passed their way. Flower, wonder who gave. Bearing away tea tray. Clock clacked. Miss Deuce took Boylan's coin, struck boldly the cash register. It clanged. Clock clacked. Fair one of Egypt teased and sorted in the till and hummed and handed coins in change. Look to the west. A clack for me. What time is that? asked Blazes Boylan. Four? O'clock. Lenahan, small eyes, a hunger on her humming, bust a humming, tugged Blazes Boylan's elbow sleeve. Let's hear the time, he said. The bag of Goulding, Collis, Ward, led Bloom by Rye Bloom, flowered tables. Aimless he chose with agitated aim, bald Pat attending, a table near the door, be near, at four. Has he forgotten? Perhaps a trick. Not come. What appetite? I couldn't do. Wait, wait. Pat, waiter, waited. Sparkling bronze azure eyed Blazer's sky-blue bow and eyes. Go on, pressed Lenahan. There's no one. He never heard. To Flora's lips did high. High, a high note pealed in the treble clear. Bronze Dutes communing with her rose that sank and rose sought, blazes Boylan's flower and eyes. Please, please, he pleaded over returning phrases of avowal. I could not leave thee. Afterwards, Miss Deuce promised coyly. No, now, urged Lenahan. Sonnez la cloche. Oh, do, there's no one. She looked. Quick, Miss Ken out of earshot, sudden bent, two kindling faces watched her bend. Quavering the cords, strayed from the air, found it again, lost cord and lost and found it, faltering. Go on, do, sonnez. Bending, she nipped a peak of skirt above her knee. Delayed. Taunted them still, bending, suspending, with willful eyes. Sonne! Smack! She set free, sudden in rebound, her nipped elastic garter smack-warm against her smackable, a woman's warm-hosed th thigh. La cloche! cried gleeful Lenahan. Trained by owner, no sawdust there. She smile-smirked supercilious. Wept, aren't men! But lightward gliding, mild, she smiled on Boylan. You're the essence of vulgarity, she in gliding said. Boylan eyed, eyed, tossed to fat lips his chalice, drank off his chalice tiny, sucking the last fat violet syrupy drops. His spellbound eyes went after, after her gliding head as it went down the bar by mirrors, Gilded arch for ginger ale, hock and claret glasses shimmering, a spiky shell where it concerted, mirrored, bronze with sunnier bronze. Yes, bronze from a nearby. Sweetheart, goodbye. I'm off, said Boylan with impatience. He slid his chalice brisk away, grasped his change. Wait a shake, begged Lanahan, drinking quickly. I wanted to tell you. Tom Roachford. Come on to Blazes, said Blazes Boylan, going. Lenahan gulped to go. Got the horn or what? he said. Wait, I'm coming. He followed the hasty creaking shoes, but stood by nimbly on the threshold, saluting forms, a bulky with a slender. How do you do, Mr. Dollard? Eh, how do, how do? Ben Dollard's vague bat. Ben Dollard's vague bass answered, turning an instant from Father Cowley's woe. He won't give you any trouble, Bob. Alf Bergen will speak to the long fellow. We'll put a barley straw in that Judas Iscariot's ear this time. Sighing, Mr. Dedalus came through the saloon, a finger soothing an eyelid. Ho, ho, we will, Ben Dollard yodel jollily. Come on, Simon, give us a ditty. We heard the piano. Bald Pat, 
bothered waiter waited for drink orders. Power for Richie. And Bloom, let me see, not make him walk twice. His corns, four now. How warm this black is. Coarse nerves a bit. Refracts, is it? Heat. Let me see. Cider, yes, bottle of cider. What's that? Mr. Dedalus said. I was only vamping, man. Come on, come on, Ben Dollard called. Be gone, dull care. Come, Bob. He ambled Dollard, bulky slops, before them. Hold that fellow with the— Hold him now. Into the saloon. He plumped him Dollard on the stool. His gouty paws plumped cords. Plumped. Stopped abrupt. Bald Pat in the doorway met tealess gold returning. Bothered, he wanted power and cider. Bronze by the window watched. Bronze from afar. Jingle, a tinkle jaunted. Bloom heard a jing, a little sound. He's off, light sob of breath. Bloom sighed on the silent blue-hued flowers. Jingling, he's gone. Jingle, here. Love and war, Ben, Mr. Dedalus said. God be with old times. Miss Deuce's brave eyes, unregarded, turned from the cross-blind, smitten by sunlight. Gone. Pensive. Who knows? Smitten. The smiting light. She lowered the drop-blind with a sliding cord. She drew down pensive. Why did he go so quick when I— About her bronze, over the bar where bald stood by Sister Gold, in exquisite contrast, contrast in exquisite non-exquisite, Slow, cool, dim, sea-green, sliding depth of shadow, eau de nil. Poor old Goodwin was the pianist that night, Father Cowley reminded them. There was a slight difference of opinion between himself and the collared grand. There was. A symposium all his own, Mr. Dedalus said. The devil wouldn't stop him. He was a crotchety old fellow in the primary stage of drink. God, do you remember? Ben Bulky Dollard said turning from the punished keyboard. And by japers I had no wedding garment. They laughed, all three. He had no wed. All trio laughed. No wedding garment. Our friend Bloom turned in handy that night, Mr. Dedalus said. Where's my pipe, by the way? He wandered back to the bar, to the lost cord pipe. Bald Pat carried the two diner's drinks, Richie and Poldy, and Father Cowley laughed again. I saved the situation, Ben, I think. You did, averred Ben Dollard. I remember those tight trousers, too. That was a brilliant idea, Bob. Father Cowley blushed to his brilliant purply lobes. He saved the situa. Tight trow. Brilliant ID. I know he was on the rocks, he said. The wife was playing the piano in the coffee palace on Saturdays for a very trifling consideration. And who was it gave me the wheeze she was doing the other business? Do you remember? We had to search all Hollis Street to find them till the chap in Keogh's gave us the number. Remember? Ben remembered, his broad visage wondering. By God, she had some luxurious opera cloaks and things there. Mr. Dedalus wandered back, pipe in hand. Marion Square style, ball dresses, by God, and court dresses. He wouldn't take any money either. What? Any God's quantity of cocked hats and boleros and trunk hose. What? Aye, aye, Mr. Dedalus nodded. Mrs. Marion Bloom has left off clothes of all descriptions. Jingle jaunted down the quays. Blazes sprawled on bounding tires. Liver and bacon, steak and kidney pie. Right, sir. Right, Pat. Mrs. Marion. Met him pike hoses, smell of burn, of Paul de Cock. Nice name, he. What's this her name was? A buxom lassie, Marion Tweedy. Yes, is she alive? And kicking. She was a daughter of. Daughter of the regiment. Yes, begad, I remember the old drum major. Mr. Dedalus struck, whizzed, lit, puffed, savory puff after. Irish? I don't know, faith. Is she, Simon? Puff after stiff, a puff, strong, savory, crackling. Buccinator muscle is, what? Bit rusty. Oh, she is, my Irish Molly, o oh. He puffed a pungent, plumy blast. From the rock of Gibraltar all the way. 
They pined in depth of ocean shadow, gold by the beer pole, bronze by maraschino, thoughtful all too. Mina Kennedy, for Lismore Terrace, drum condra with I Dolores, a queen Dolores, silent. Pat served uncovered dishes. Leopold cut liver slices. As said before, he ate with relish the inner organs, nutty gizzards, fried cods rose, while Richie Golding, Collis, Ward, ate steak and kidney, steak, then kidney, bite by bite of pie he ate, bloom ate, they ate. Bloom with Golding, married in silence, ate, dinners fit for princes. By bachelor's walk jog jaunty jingled blazes boilin' bachelor, in sun, in heat, mare's glossy rump a trot, with flick of whip on bounding tires, sprawled, warm-seated, boilin' impatience, ardent bold. Horn, have you the— Horn, have you the— Ha-ha horn! Over their voices dollared, bassooned attack, booming over bombarding chords. When love absorbs my ardent soul— Roll of Ben Sol Benjamin rolled to the quivery love shivery roof panes. War, war! cried Father Cowley. You're the warrior. So I am, Ben Warrior laughed. I was thinking of your landlord. Love or money. He stopped. He wagged huge beard, huge face over his blunder huge. Sure, you'd burst the tympanum of her ear, man, Mr. Dedalus said through smoke aroma. "'with an organ like yours.' "'In bearded, abundant laughter, "'Dollard shook upon the keyboard. "'He would. "'Not to mention another membrane,' "'Father Cowley added. "'Half-time, Ben. "'Amoroso manantropo. "'Let me there.' "'Miss Kennedy served two gentlemen "'with tankards of cool stout. "'She passed a remark. "'It was, indeed, first gentleman said, "'beautiful weather.' They drank cool stout. Did she know where the Lord Lieutenant was going? And heard steel hoofs, ring hoof ring. No, she couldn't say, but it would be in the paper. Oh, she need not trouble, no trouble. She waved about her, outspread independent, searching. The Lord Lieutenant, her pinnacles of hair slow moving, Lord Lieutenant. Too much trouble, first gentleman said. Oh, not in the least, way he looked that, Lord Lieutenant. Gold by bronze heard iron steel. My ardent soul, I care not for o'er the morrow. In liver gravy blew mashed, mashed potatoes. Love and war someone is. Ben Dollard's famous. Night he ran round to us to borrow a dress suit for that concert. Trousers tight as a drum on him. Musical porkers. Molly did laugh when he went out. Threw herself back across the bed, screaming, kicking, with all his belongings on show. Oh, saints above, I'm drenched. Oh, the women in the front row. Oh, I never laughed so many. Well, of course, that's what gives him the bass barrel tone. For instance, eunuchs. Wonder who's playing. Nice touch. Must be Cowley. Musical. Knows whatever note you play. Bad breath he has, poor chap. Stopped. Miss Deuce, engaging, Lydia Deuce, bowed to suave solicitor, George Lidwell, gentleman, entering. Good afternoon. She gave her moist, a lady's, hand to his firm clasp. Afternoon. Yes, yeah, she was back, to the old ding-dong again. Your friends are inside, Mr. Lidwell. George Lidwell, suave, solicited, held a Lydia hand. Bloom ate live as said before. Clean here, at least. That chap in the Burton, gummy with gristle. No one here, Goulding and I. Clean tables, flowers, mitres of napkins. Pat to and fro, bald pat. Nothing to do. Best value in dub. Piano again. Cowley it is, way he sits into it, like one together, mutual understanding. Tiresome shapers, scraping fiddles, eye on the bow-end, sawing the cello, remind you of toothache. Her high, long snore. Night we were in the box, trombone under, blowing like a grampus between the acts, other brass chap unscrewing, emptying spittle. Conductor's legs, too, bags-trousers, jiggity-jiggity. Do right to hide them. 
jiggity jingle jaunty jaunty only the harp lovely gold glowering light girl touched it poop of a lovely gravy's rather good fit for a golden ship erin the harp that once or twice cool hands ben house the rhododendrons we are their harps i he old young ah i couldn't man mr dedalus said shy listless strongly go on blast you ben dollard growled get it out in bits mapari simon father cowley said down stage he strode some paces grave tall in affliction his long arms outheld hoarsely the apple of his throat hoarsed softly softly he sang to a dusty seascape there a last farewell a headland a ship a sail upon the billows farewell a lovely girl her veil a wave upon the wind upon the headland what wind around her cowley sang ma pari tout amour il mio sgardo le contre she waved unhearing cowley her veil to one departing dear one to wind love speeding sail return go on simon ah sure my dancing days are done ben well mr dedalus laid his pipe to rest beside the tuning fork and sitting touched the obedient keys no simon father cowley turned play it in the original one flat the keys obedient rose higher told faltered confessed confused upstage strode father cowley here simon i'll accompany you he said get up by graham lemon's pineapple rock by elvery's elephant jingly jogged steak kidney liver mashed at meat fit for princes sat princes bloom and goulding princes at meat they raised and drank power and cider most beautiful tenor air ever written richie said sonambula he heard joel ma sing that one night ah what mcguckin yes in his way choir boy style Mas was the boy Mas mass boy a lyrical tenor if you like never forget it never tenderly bloom over liverless bacon saw the tightened features strain backache he bright's bright eye next item on the program paying the piper pills pounded bread worth a guinea a box stave it off a while sings too down among the dead men appropriate kidney pie sweets to the not making much hand of it best value in characteristic of him power particular about his drink flaw in the glass fresh vartry water fecking matches from counters to save then squander a sovereign in dribs and drabs and when he's not wanted a farthing screwed refusing to pay his fare curious types End of chapter 11a read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org on June 16th 2006 in Oceanside California